Lieutenant General Atta Hasnain, uh, who will be speaking to us on uh, the situation in Jammu and Kashmir and uh, Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. As you know, uh, last year, 370 was uh, nullified. And uh, since then, a lot of things have happened in Kashmir. So he'll give us a, uh, an overview of the situation and what that uh, momentous change has meant for Kashmir and for uh, India and for India-Pakistan relations, what impact it has had on Pak-sponsored uh, terrorism. And the second talk will be by uh, Ambassador uh, Kamal Sibyl, former Foreign Secretary, who will speak later on uh, India's uh, foreign policy. But uh, uh, let me now request uh, General Atahasna to kindly address the participants. Jahan, the Namaskar. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Director Saab, for inviting me for this talk. Uh, can I can Anutuma just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, since I don't have very much time, an hour and 15 minutes or so, my intention is to try and keep maximum time for questions and answers because there are a lot of people. Uh, who are networked with us and there are a lot of people from abroad and probably also a lot of people listening to us on Facebook. So I will quickly share my uh, content with you. If I can just do that. Just a second. Okay, I'm good to go. My subject is the removal of Article 370, the situation in Jammu and Kashmir, and uh, dealing with Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. This is not changing. One second. Sorry, problems of technology. Right. Um, as a prologue, if I may commence as a prologue, uh, my uh, the removal of Article 370, because Article 370 gave a special status to JNK. Uh, it was to my in my perception, can be there can be many counter arguments by people, but in my perception, necessity. A separatist vision and an identity were enabled by the exclusivity which was given by Article 370. Right at the beginning, I'm almost reading out from my slide to tell you, to set the stage for you. It was also helping Pakistan pursue its sponsored proxy war, which has started in 1989, and it was virtually pursuing for many years before that. Situation after the 5th of August 2019, that's when the Article 375A were abrogated and the a new uh, structure was created for the administration of Jammu and Kashmir. The situation after that may not have returned to full normality or normalcy, as you call it, but the security situation definitely today is far more stable. Governance is easier, uh, even as steps to democracy are underway. So that is the setting I want to just explain you that it's not as if you have achieved everything. But progress, we are making a lot of progress and the situation today is far, far better than what it was ever before. To comprehend what has actually happened, why 370 was removed, what the situation is today, and where is Jammu and Kashmir heading tomorrow? A brief analysis of the following issues is necessary to make sure that those who are not aware of the intricacies of this issue they can comprehend it a little better. First thing is Jammu and Kashmir's strategic importance. Why is everyone interested? Why is Pakistan so interested? Why is China so interested? Why are the big powers so interested? And particularly, why is India so interested? A lot of people say that, uh, you know, we have spent so much of money defending our borders and Jammu and Kashmir has been a trigger uh, in the defense of all this uh, which has gone on. Why don't we just part with Jammu and Kashmir and perhaps hope to be able to gain peace. You have to understand this entire concept from the maps, and that's what I will explain to you. 
Pakistan's game plan, what Pakistan wants to achieve, what it attempted to achieve, what it has hopes to achieve still. And lastly, our counter strategy, the failure and success part of it. So let me start with a map of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, or rather uh, of, of Asia. And on this map, although you can speak for a couple of hours, I will only restrict myself to two, three things about Jammu and Kashmir. Just look at my cursor. This is Jammu and Kashmir, and it's the correct representation of the boundary of Jammu and Kashmir. This is how all everyone in India likes to, to ensure that we always represent our boundary like this. If you just pick it out of Google and represent uh, the map of India, you will find it many times axed out with, Jammu, with portions of Axai Chin and Gilgit Baltistan removed from it. So this is the correct map. Now, what I want you to appreciate in this particular map is not anything of so much about India as I want you to appreciate more about Pakistan. This is Pakistan, and Pakistan is a very important country as far as its real estate is concerned. Uh, economically, the doldrums, 200 million people who are uh, uh, virtually on the on, on stage, on, on the many stages of starvation, perhaps, but geostrategically a very important nation because it is surrounded by many, many important civilizations, the Indian, Chinese, the Central Asian, the Persian and the Arab. All routes of access into the heart of Asia, which is in Central Asia here, is through Pakistan and all access from, from the heart of Asia into the Arabian Sea or the Indian Ocean is also through Pakistan, primarily because Iran remains a pariah state uh, at the moment. The future crucible of um, hydrocarbons in the Caspian Sea area, while it has got uh, access towards Europe from this direction, but access to the Indian Ocean and access towards Southeast Asia is all through Pakistan at the moment. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir here is very important from the angle of its connectivity to China is through the territory of Jammu and Kashmir that Pakistan has actually got access to China and would always want to have a broader base, a broader swath of territory through which connectivity with this all-weather friend China is always maintained. So this is something which you need to just keep in mind. I, as an aside, with all that is happening in Ladakh today, it may also be interesting to keep in mind the fact that China also has its uh, overland connectivity to the warm waters of the Arabian Sea, to the port of Gwadar, through the territory of Jammu and Kashmir, Gilgit Baltistan. Circumventing the Strait Saka, through which otherwise the sea lines of communication, the East China coast here, would otherwise normally flow. All uh, energy traffic from the Middle East flows along the sea lines of communication through the Straits of Malacca, and the container traffic, which makes up for much of China's growth, also moves through uh, the Straits of Malacca. And that is why it is very important that if India, that China always perceives that India could possibly, uh, possibly. Uh, block these routes and that is why it always wishes to have an overland access. Part of this is the Belt and Road Initiative, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is a part of this, this entire strategic game. Okay, now if you are looking at Jammu and Kashmir, this is what the segments at the moment, this entire territory belongs to India. Very clearly outlined by the 22nd February 1994 resolution, but the reality today, the reality today is this, that it's divided up into certain segments. This portion which you see here is under India's control. Uh, now Union Territory, the Valley, Kashmir and Jammu, a Union Territory today. That's the only portion which is actually in the, under India's control. Otherwise, the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, Gilgit, Baltistan, and the area of Shaksgam, the Shaksgam Valley, which has been handed over by Pakistan to China illegally, all this is not under our control at the moment. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor flows through this to POK and down into the port of Gwadar. This side is the Aksai chain area, under, partly, partially under control of China, uh, where which also the major part of it does not exist with us. So there are certain there are certain borders here which you must know. There are Border and Jammu is uh, in green marked here, about 200 kilometers, is uh, a no, non-contested border, it's an it's international border, but Pakistan still believes that there is a there has to be a finality to it later. So it calls it the working boundary and not the international border. 
Uh, the purple line you see here, almost 770 kilometers long, is the line of control, which is demarcated, delineated, on map, on ground. Uh, there's a strange uh, phenomenon here. Of course, there's eyeball to eyeball uh, deployment of the Pakistan Army and the Indian Army, and the he's on and keep it. So everyone is generally on tenter hooks in this in this area. From here, this here, green part portion here, from a place called NJ nine eight four two, is the uh, is the actual ground position line near the Siachen Glacier along the Saltoro Ridge. More about this a little later. I'll try and explain to you. The the uh, Karakoram Pass is located here, and you can see that uh, this area has a thing called the Line of Actual Control (LAC). The LAC is a uh, notional here. It is not really marked. It's not delineated on ground or on map. There are perceptions which China has and perceptions that we have, and which is what has led to the current standoff which is going on in the uh, Ladakh region. So these are this is the broad idea uh, understanding of the of the divisions of Jammu and Kashmir. But keep it in the back of your mind. There may be divisions existing on the map and the reality on ground, but in actual, this entire area belongs to India as per the resolution of 1994 and especially after the publication of the maps. This is the map of Jammu and Kashmir, 1st October 2019. The decision of 5th of uh, August um, translated on ground effectively from the 1st of October 2019. The whole of Gilgit, Baltistan, Aksai, Chin, and the whole of Ladakh being included in the Union Territory of Ladakh here, in which Kargil, you always also have the hill area of the Kargil. And you have Jammu and Kashmir, Kashmir on top, and Jammu here, uh, which is the Union, second Union Territory. This is the way the official map of India is now put out to the world. Of course, there are counter maps being created by Pakistan all the time, trying to put out their claims. But we are very clear, this is, this is what how the map exists today. Now, uh, those of you who have perhaps never had the chance to look at Kashmir very closely, this is a depiction, a painting, actually, uh, of uh, the Kashmir Valley. What is the meaning of the Kashmir Valley? It is uh, Kashmir Valley is made up by the Pir Panjal range, where you see my cursor, and the Kishtwa range on the eastern side, the Shamshabari range in the north, primarily here, and uh, a portion of the Great Himalayan range. Here you can see the line of control marked in purple, running all along for matter of interest. This is Punch and this is Uri and this is the famous Haji Pir Balch, which was captured by India in 1965. It was captured in 1947-48 also. It was not retained by us. In 65, we captured it again at great cost. It was not uh, retained by us again. Thereafter, it was handed over back in the Tashkent summit. And uh, 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 you find this is this is the, the Jhelum River. It starts from very Nag here, flows through Srinagar, takes a turn at the Wool Lake and goes past Uri into the into, into uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, the Amarnath Crave cave, where every year you have the great uh, pilgrimage, is here. You start from Anantra, come up to Pahalgam, where you have the roadhead, and from here it's a 48 kilometer excursion walk to Amanath, which is at the height of approximately 13,000 feet. And this is Srinagar. Uh, when we talk about North and South Kashmir, this is the broad line of division. The What are two things about North and South Kashmir? North Kashmir, this is the area, prominent landmarks, Kukwara, Handwara, Baramula, uh, a place here called Bandipura, uh, yeah, Gandharbal here. Uh, the important thing here is that the line of control is in the north through a very, very difficult area, snowed up in the winter. But for six months, seven, eight months of the year, it is open and there's a tremendous amount of efforts at infiltration through this area. That is how the human resource element of terrorism is made up through efforts of uh, infiltration. Uh, this is a forested area here into which a lot of terrorists come and gravitate. South Kashmir here is the area where local terrorists are far more. North Kashmir, you have more foreign terrorists. This South Kashmir is the area which is richer in content. Um, it has got uh, more white collar workers. It's got uh, better crops, uh, um, better uh, apple crop. The orchards are far, far superior here. 
in a place called Pompor, you have uh, some very good saffron fields. But the most important thing is here that uh, the ideological center of the Jamate Islami, which has now been banned, is also located just south of Anantanag here at a place called Kulgam. So at the moment, uh, at the time when the decision of 5th of August was taken, it was South Kashmir which was generally uh, what is called burning with the terror activities. Uh, this is the place where Burhan Wani, uh, the so-called uh, renegade, so-called Robin Hood figure who, was, who, who had become a cult figure in the, in, for about two to three years, uh, attempted to try and take over the Hezbollah Mujahideen leadership. And it's from where, there that he was operating. Uh, he was eliminated in 2016, but the terrorism has been generally been localized in this area, much more local. South of the Pir Panjal, this area had a fair amount of terrorist activity also, but started drying up sometime around about 2008, 2009, and by about 2014, 15, had virtually dried up completely. So at the moment, you have terror activities which are primarily uh, restricted to the Kashmir region, that's the valley region. The other thing to remember is that the law of infiltration takes place from the uh, from the line of control south of the Pir Panjal here between Punch and Noshera, Khnur, these areas. And from here, once if, if they are successful, then they try and head into the valley through the passes of the Pir Panjal Pass here. We do not have much of a counter infiltration grid here, although there is an existent grid, but not such a strong grid as the one which exists to the north. So what are the drivers of conflict today? Can I put out to you on the bullet form on the left and see it and quickly just connect up Pakistani sentiment for retribution. Retribution for what? Retribution for 1971, the loss of East Pakistan, which is today Bangladesh. The Islamic connection. Pakistan always believes that um, Jammu and Kashmir is a Muslim majority, is, has an Islamic majority, and therefore it was a natural affiliation to Pakistan. And uh, it has made a lot of strident efforts to try and change the ideology of Jammu and Kashmir, of Kashmir Valley in particular, even areas south of the Pir Panjal, to try and have a greater Islamic connect with it. Then the waters issue, it knows that um, it is the lower riparian state. India is the upper riparian state. A very large part of these rivers, uh, the sources lie uh, up in Kashmir, in Jammu and Kashmir. And it always fears that the control of these waters in the hands of India is a major threat to the, it, it's like an existential threat to Pakistan. And then the China factor. Uh, it is well. It is it is both ways. China desires and desires Pakistan, and Pakistan desires China. Pakistan desires China primarily to balance out India. Similarly, China also desires Pakistan because militarily it balances out, out India towards the west, forces a very large commitment of troops towards the west. Otherwise, if the problem of Pakistan did not exist, then Indian Indian focus would be completely to the north, to the Himalayan borders. Uh, there is a strategic connectivity between China and uh, Pakistan, which um, uh, is aiding Pakistan, aiding China tremendously. And this is an issue which it does not want to be resolved. It does not want Kashmir to be resolved in that manner. It wants Gilead Baltistan always to remain under its control so that this connectivity for both countries remains is something which is mutually beneficial. Pakistan is a deep state, and I'll explain this to you in a little greater detail. What is the meaning of a deep state? It is a deep state which controls. It's not that every Pakistani is in, is in a state of enmity with India. Uh, um, many Pakistanis are just normal human beings who would like to just carry on with life, uh, have some kind of a normality in their, in their lives. But Pakistan is not ruled democratically. On paper, it is. You have a government headed by Prime Minister Imran Khan today, also known as the selected Prime Minister. But... Uh, we know that actually who rules Pakistan, and I'll explain that to you subsequently. And then, of course, the rising strategic confidence of India, which is what has led to the recent standoff with China in Ladakh, in which Pakistan has also got a, a kind of a deeply hidden role. Uh, both Pakistan and China would not like to see a rising India, a confident India. And that's exactly what has been happening in the last five, six, seven years, where a rising India uh, has has been perceived as a major threat to the interests of both China and Pakistan. So I go back to uh, explain to you why, why did Pakistan undertake all that it's doing in, in, in Kashmir. It's done this for the better part of the last 70 years actually and over that. But in the last 30 years or so, it's remained focused 
with a kind of a strategy, a very a strategy which was started developing in the late 70s, was uh, progressed in the 80s, refined in the 80s, and undertaken and executed sometime around in 1989 and 90. So the first thing is that Pakistan is very clear in its perception, and this is the time of uh, Ziaul Haq that this whole strategy was started getting uh, conceptualized. The first thing is that uh, Ziaul Haq it was clear that Pakistan was unable to match India's conventional army. It's too big, double the size of, China, of, of, of Pakistan. Nor can, it, nor can it match India's economic strength. And that's a reality because if you see today, India has a, 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 a foreign exchange reserve, for example, of $538 billion. How do you compare it to China, Pakistan, which has got $12 to $13 billion? So to achieve any retribution for 1971, it was not possible to do it um, either the military way or the economic way. It was necessary to achieve a nuclear parity to overcome this asymmetry so that Pakistan perceives that so that it would not be bullied by India from time to time. Therefore, it decided that the best way of seeking uh, retribution and revenge for 71 was through what it called a war by a thousand cuts which is also called a hybrid war. What is a hybrid war? Now, a hybrid war, sometimes uh, mistakenly called a grey zone war. Grey zone war is a little beyond a hybrid war. That's a term which has come up in the last three or four years. Grey zone particularly has come up um, after, after Ukraine, after the Russian intervention in Ukraine, and after the Russian intervention in the political, uh, political system of the United States attempting and retaining a capability to influence politically. That is what has led uh, hybrid warfare plus the capability of, uh, of a political intervention has what has led to the term called grey zone warfare. But hybrid war itself, which is what Pakistan has um, uh, launched against India for many years, it's, a, it's, a, it's the conflict of what is called the conflict of the millennium, which combines various parts of the spectrum of conflict. And you can have conventional war, you may not go whole hog on conventional war, but part of conventional war, for example, LOC exchanges of fire on the line of control. You can have irregular war, right? Uh, you can have terrorism. You can have cyber, economic warfare, transnational crime like Daoud Ibrahim or something involved like that. Violent extremism of this kind and uh, of the Al-Qaeda kind, of the ISIS kind. Psychological warfare or war by communication, which is also known as fifth generation warfare. Something like what's happening in Ladakh at the moment. You're finding limited coercion on ground militarily, but a huge attempt to try and bring fifth generation warfare against India through media, through global times and all kinds of things by the uh, Chinese war machine, which is a part of their concept of warfare. And this is exactly what 30 years ago the Pakistanis decided, chose to, to use. Why is it such a, why is it of advantage to a weaker state? Particularly because it provides flexibility and longevity with limited exhaustion of resources. Pakistan could not have spent this kind of money uh, to fight a pitched battle in, in Kashmir. But it is uh, doing this very, very appropriately, adroitly at the moment, using very limited resources. The, what are the essentials of Pakistan's trans-LOC proxy campaign? Once it decided in 1989 that it would launch this war, human resources, the terrorists, overground workers, overground workers are those who are not terrorists, but uh, and they are not they are not covered. They are above ground. They are they are in the media. They are in in, in they are in government. They are in education. They are, they are in all kinds of things. They can be businessmen. All kinds of people who can come and shake hands with you every day, and you cannot put them behind bars. But they are actually working on behalf of the of the other state. They are working on behalf of the terrorists. You have ideologues. You have local recruiters. Media people, logisticians, those who provide safe houses. Uh, today, the cost of safe houses has increased a lot in Kashmir because of uh, you know the overall the overall surveillance which has gone up in such a big way. Then you have wherewithal to un be undertake this kind of a war. You need guns, ammunition, ID material, cars, all kinds of things like that. You found that the Pulwama blast used up a a car. It had a, a fair amount of. Uh, of um, ID material, explosive, which had been placed inside it. It must have taken a month, month and a half to prepare that car bomb. Then you need finances, a steady flow of finances, physical cash. You need bank accounts. You need foreign transfers, which must not be caught by the government systems. You need a hawala. You need drug trafficking. 
So you need money from the drug trafficking which comes out. And you have ideology. Extremist Islam, in this case the Ahle Hadith is one of them. You have the clergy, you have rabble rousers, those who can on the moment go, who can collect together a thousand people and uh, read the right act to them. Then you have Urdu media, you have literature and you have social media. Ever since 2011 in particularly, uh, in particular social media has made a world of a difference um, in the ability of the street, the ability of the rabble rouser, the ideological uh, elements who can bring people out of their houses uh, to contest uh, in the form of mobs. All this is, this is a lethal combined, this entire thing. And the important thing is the people. It is the people who are the center of gravity. Getting them on the terrorist side, on the ideologue side, on the separatist side is important for them. It's equally important for us in the in the in the sir in the uh, security uh, forces to ensure that the center of gravity, the people, are on our side. So, what's a deep state? This is a deep state. This is the deep state which runs Pakistan. It's, it's a state within a state. It's a form of a clandestine government made up of a hidden or covert networks of power operating independently of a state's political leadership in pursuit of their own agenda. Now, the deep state in Pakistan, for example, consists of um, the army leadership, elements of the army leadership, the ISI leadership, uh, many people from the legal profession, many veterans of the ex-servicemen as we uh, know them, uh, uh, and people of this, this kind. Uh, many religious chieftains, leaders who put together have more personal interests than anything else. And in this case, they're convinced that they seem to think that they have India in a bind with the activities that they are doing in terms of the war by a thousand cuts and that it, it, it can live with those. It can, that India has got, that they actually have very few options at the moment, but can live with those. At the other side, why the deep state exists in Pakistan in this case, the sponsor state, there is also a, what is called a proxy war terror ecosystem which, which functions in the target state. And the target state is India in this case and particularly with focus is Jammu and Kashmir and particularly the Kashmir Valley. It's a, it's, a, it's a proxy war ecosystem. This is the nexus of politics, media, very, very shady organizations includes NGOs, lawyers, academics, intellectuals, bankers, all kinds of people who run this whole system clandestinely, uh, being above the above the being above board, nothing against them legally. That's why it takes lots of years to pursue uh, these kind of networks. We have never gone after these networks with a focus, except starting from 2017. And that is what led very largely to the success that we gained in 2019. So why was the decision on Article 370 so timely and correct when it was taken? I believe that uh, from 2016, it was evident that Pakistan, after Burhan Wani's death particularly, and the manner that Pakistan saw the passion in the streets which came out after the death of Burhan Wani and a better part of one year, uh, we were in a bit of a, we had taken a, almost a back step. It was evident that they would give a fillip to this the strategy of getting the streets going, getting the people's movement going here. Internationally, India's seriousness about Jammu and Kashmir needed more impact. We believe that we are on the right. We believe that we were morally correct, that, the, that uh, Jammu and Kashmir had legally opted for India. The Maharaja had opted for India. We had a resolution going by our parliament that the whole of Jammu and Kashmir belongs to India. But the credibility and the believability of that internationally had to make an impact. The Kashmir's people needed a very clear message that Azadi was never possible, integration was the only way. Now, I must uh, mention at this stage, it's important that while you understand that the people are the center of gravity in such a situation, in such a campaign, uh, there is always an abstract idea behind this also, which becomes the center of gravity. The center of gravity identified by me, the way I look at it, is uh, actually the idea of Azadi, that Azadi is possible for Kashmir, for Jammu and Kashmir. It is behind this idea that the people of Kashmir tend to rally and therefore to defeat this idea or that Azadi was possible, you needed to remove all those, all those uh, uh, 
uh, legal issues which tended to give the Kashmiri, the, Jam, the people of Jammu and Kashmir, an idea that they were separate, an idea that they were exclusive. And therefore, the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A was absolutely essential. What are the challenges for India now? Therefore, this is an important aspect which I just want to highlight. Firstly, infiltration, Pakistan aided infiltration on the line of control and the international border has to be controlled. But this is the human element, that element of terrorists, terrorists coming in. This is the element of leadership coming in. This is also the place from where the wherewithal for operations come. So this has to be under control. Second is that if we conduct hard operations to eliminate terrorists, it is always inevitable that at some stage or the other, the local population will suffer. And that leads to alienation. So the biggest challenge for us is always to maintain a balance in our operations to ensure that while we neutralize, eliminate terrorists, there's a least or the minimum amount of inconvenience caused to the local public, although the local public tends to be very, very much against the security forces. Media in Jammu and Kashmir and the rest of India, media in Jammu and Kashmir, you'll be surprised to know 30 English newspapers are published here, and that many are not published in any city uh, in the in, in, uh, rest of India. 30 of them are published in, in Kashmir, or maybe even more. And uh, they, they spew out all kinds of venom uh, against India. And Indian democracy has has tolerated this for all these years. Now, recently, a modicum of control has come after, after this abrogation of C-70 that oh, over, the, over the media. Pakistan has also been very adroit in its information war and its diplomatic blitzkrieg around the world. Uh, we have been a little laid back on this issue, but of course we have gained a lot today and much more is being done about it, particularly on the aspect of information war. And that's where the justification for lifting the 4G networks from Jammu and Kashmir comes in. If the 4G networks post 5 August had not been lifted, you would have found a, a complete uh, blitzkrieg from the Pakistani side as far as information war was concerned, um, as far as video clips were concerned, and all kinds of things which exploiting the connectivity which exists uh, there between the uh, two sides of the line of control. And of course, man managing international opinion preventing internationalization. We don't want this internationalized because the Shim, as per the Shimla Accord, it's very clear that whatever issues have to be there in Jammu and Kashmir have to be bilaterally resolved between India and Pakistan. But it is Pakistan's intent. Right from the moment it signed the Shimla Accord and got its 93,000 prisoners back, its effort has only been towards how to ensure the internationalization and putting a pressure of, uh, on India and bringing the United Nations back into this whole game. At every meeting with Pakistan, they will always try and bring in the issue of the UN military observers and the role of the United Nations and the, the UN resolution in 1948 calling for uh, the plebiscite uh, um, uh, in, in, in Jammu and Kashmir. So these are some of the challenges which continue to exist for us. Sorry. Uh, so post 5 August 2019, Pakistan appeared to have been shell-shocked by the Indian decisions. What has been the effect immediately on Pakistan? It is threatening abrogation of the Shimla Accord. It's not said it officially. But uh, in every other meeting here and there, every other place you find in the media, sometimes you'll find elements of the deep state keep talking about that the Shimla Accord is no longer valid because India has abrogated 370 and the status of, of uh, 1972 has been disturbed. It perceives, it perceives that the effect of India's financial clout, um, India's much larger economy uh, will be felt on Jammu and Kashmir and that uh, it may be a matter of time before India through the use of economics uh, actually starts getting the people to start getting more and more closer to, uh, to, to India. So it will therefore make greater efforts to try and ideologically um, um, try and retain the loyalty of the, of the, of the people of Kashmir. Uh, it, it launched a very large diplomatic offensive immediately after the 5th of August, but somehow it has not succeeded uh, too much. There are a few countries, Malaysia, Iran, Turkey, uh, the elements within the OIC who are 
uh, against Saudi Arabia. At the same time, you find Saudi Arabia, the UAE, very important countries, Bahrain, have all sided with India and all said that this is an internal affair of India. Um, it is finding rekindling in Jammu and Kashmir difficult because with the control that we have established, the networks particularly that India has controlled, the Indian, net, Indian security system has managed to control, it is finding it difficult to rekindle, although I say that it is impossible for Pakistan to rekindle at the, at the moment. It is fearing an Indian emboldenment over Gilgit, Pakistan and Pakistan occupation. There have been many statements from our leaders to say it's just a matter of time before Gilgit Baltistan become part of India, Pakistan occupied Kashmir comes back to India. Uh, often there are quotes about given about the 22nd February parliamentary resolution of 1994, which calls for uh, uh, Indians to aspire for the return of all territories of Jammu and Kashmir. So, fearing this, it is feeling that oh, progressively India is going to get more. And more emboldened. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why um, it perhaps went to China and China and Pakistan put together as a part of the uh, securitization of the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor and the future of Chinese presence in Gilgit Baltistan uh, attempted to do what it's doing in Ladakh at the moment. And it is therefore seeking a much greater Chinese and, and Islamic role, hoping that it can divide the OIC and seek um, uh, you know, go over the head of Saudi Arabia and try and seek support of the Islamic world. So what must India do? I think I'm almost at the last slide. And what must India do? What it is doing at the moment? And uh, what does it need to do further? I've put it into five domains. These are the domains, if, if you have to examine any strategic issue around the world, these are the five domains in which you can all examine an issue. So I'll start with that. Military. It needs to control, India needs to control infiltration to make sure that if you have killed 180 terrorists this year, you have to make sure that 180 more don't come in by infiltration. We have to ensure the neutralization of the overground worker networks so that we can prevent recruitment, we can prevent finances coming in, and we can reduce the terror footprint overall. There's no point at the end of the year killing 200, 250 terrorists and having 200 created by recruitment and 50, 60 coming in by infiltration because you come back to square one. So this is a major challenge for the military. So while undertaking these operations, it is also important for the military and the security establishment to ensure that uh, there is a balance in these operations between hard and soft power, which is the, goes as per the tenets of counterinsurgency operations around the world. On the social domain, outreach to the people is essential to get the people on your side, to make sure the people are not alienated, the people do not go to the side of the terrorists. All of government approach is needed. Any hybrid war, you cannot fight in the military domain alone. It cannot be an AK-47 against AK-47. It cannot be a soldier against a terrorist. It has to be fought in every single domain of governance. So that is very, very important. Restoration of confidence of the people, along with de-radicalization and counter-radicalization, which is an issue by itself, and someone probably have a question on this. Politically, restore the grassroots political activity, and this is going to take fairly long, this political process. Help bring Jammu and Srinagar, that is the segments north and south of Pir Panjal, help bring them together. I think the best decision taken by the government of India was to keep Jammu and Kashmir as a single entity as a union territory and not separate them into separate union territories. This is because, in my perception and perception of most people who know Jammu and Kashmir well, it is that the solution to Kashmir, socially, politically, economically, lies through the Jammu route. The people of Jammu are the people who understand Kashmir the best. And it is this bond which must be restored. It is only temporarily offset for the moment. Economic, it is reduced corruption. Balanced deployment of resources between the Jammu segment and the Kashmir segment. Invite investment with incentive. Much more incentive. Now that you've opened up the coffers, it's, you can invite. And there is a lot of activity going on today. With the governor there, a lot of it with the governor's administration attempts to be. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has come in the middle of it. Otherwise, by now, a lot of efforts. All India were going on to try and bring money into, into Jammu and Kashmir. Diplomatically, Isolate Pakistan, neutralize the Sino-Pakistan nexus, which is happening aut automatically. You're seeing this with the Quad, 
uh, the last few days, you're finding the Deputy Secretary of State of the United States in India. But I need to caution you that right at the beginning, the first map I showed you, that Pakistan's strategic, geostrategic location is a very important location. It plays, continues to play a very important role in Afghanistan. And therefore, the United States cannot detach itself completely from Pakistan as <coughs> what India may desire. What is important is to develop what I call the India narrative. The Indian voice internationally must be heard because ours is the voice of reason. Ours is the voice of legality. That brings me to the end of my talk. I've taken about 40 minutes and I've still got enough time to be able to address a lot of questions for which I will hopefully have all the answers. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not sure how we are going to yeah. go about uh, doing the yeah, question I, and answers. No, thank you very much yeah. uh, for, for that uh, presentation. And uh, I would encourage the uh, participants to engage with you. Many of them have uh, joined us for the first time. So we'll try and take questions from them uh, so that, uh, you know, some of these doubts which are there uh, in uh, public's mind could be uh, removed. And uh, the participants uh, know that you are a former core commander know the area very well and uh, you are a, a, a well-known commentator so i think they would like to engage with you and let me just club these questions uh, because there are a lot of questions and uh, some overlap also but as i was okay. going through the uh, chat box i'll just pick up uh, a few and uh, around that we can build the uh, narrative I think a lot of these questions uh, have already been answered by your last slide, where you have uh, uh, dealt with India's uh, responses, etc. But still, I think a few questions are there. So one question is that uh, what could be the negative consequences? I think they are referring to Pakistan, how Pakistan can use 370 and uh, uh, create terrorism, etc. And how we should uh, deal with that. So that's, I think, uh, one question. Uh, which you have okay. uh, more or less answered it, but you may like to I add. will answer it in more detail. Yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, maybe a couple of... Would you like to combine a few questions? Yeah, Would you I like think... to combine a few questions? Yeah, that's better because otherwise we don't have the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then there yeah. is the question about uh, the four-point formula. Uh, they want to know about this okay. four-point formula. And uh, okay. was that the closest we got to solving the Kashmir, Kashmir issue? What are your thoughts about it? And uh, then I think uh, there is also another question again relating to uh, terrorism, indigenization of the terrorist activities, uh, okay. which is the ISI strategy, uh, or is it okay. something which is organic? Uh, you know whether it is inbuilt in the situation. So maybe you could uh, take this uh, terrorism-related four-point formula. And maybe I will also add okay. one question, which is I think about China. Also, there are some questions. Uh, China and Kashmir. How can India keep uh, China away from uh, uh, Kashmir? And since now China is building this uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, etc. So, what are the uh, Indian uh, options? How can India, uh, you know, keep China away from this? And one question which was asked yesterday, I will repeat it uh, today, uh, which right. could have some military uh, connotations also. Uh, uh, will India be able to take back the lost territories or uh, how can uh, can India take back uh, lost territories? I think that was a question okay. Maybe you could also like to answer. So I think this will probably give you enough the next few okay. questions. This gives me a lot of, lot of things to talk about. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sir. That, these are, I think, well-selected questions. Uh, and I'll try and take them sequentially. <clears throat> what would be the negative uh, connotations of the of the abrogation of uh, Article 370. Well, uh, <clears throat> so far as uh, we are concerned, uh, India has seen the positive uh, fallout of it in the in the valley. The rest of India has, of course, supported it completely. Politically, it has been supported across the board. Uh, in the valley, to say that everyone has supported it may not be entirely right, because uh, alienation has been very very deep set in the valley as a result of a lot of propaganda which has happened over the over the many years the ideological kind of change which has taken place from time to time so as a result i think we still have to work overtime uh, to regain 
the confidence of the people. Because if you go to Kashmir today, you will get different opinion from the kind of people you speak to. There is a pro-India element which was uh, not so evident uh, before 5th of August. It has got emboldened. It has come out. It is speaking a little more. Uh, our efforts are trying to try and give them more confidence. Uh, there is an, but there is a hardcore element. There's no doubt. There is a hardcore element there. Radicalized, uh, very very pro-Pakistan, uh, very anti-India, which is um, uh, a very much a part of the overground worker community, <laughs> deeply uh, embedded into the into the uh, networks there. I think one of the reasons why why we have not been able to achieve so much beyond the military achievements of neutralizing terrorists is the reason that we did not understand that this was not a military problem. Although everyone paid lip service to it and said that it's not a military problem, it's a political problem. I had, I'm forced to go beyond and say it was never a military problem. It was a political problem. It became an ideological problem. right? And it's the ideological problem which led to this uh, very, very deep uh, set mindsets uh, of the time. Uh, anti-India anti mindsets of the time. And a generational change took place over 30 years. So as a result, when, when, when children see their parents going through that kind of a thing, and they themselves come up in this very, very anti-India kind of an environment in their households, etc., you don't expect that there is going to be a very, very positive outcome of this entire thing. So to my mind, one of the biggest challenges which exists is at the moment to get rid of this. And uh, it is not easy, but... At the same time, it needs a sense of commitment and it needs a strategy, which India is in the process of evolving. I can assure you, I have been an observer of the Indian, uh, our, our strategy in Kashmir Kash Kash over many, many years. Uh, I remember the time when we used to only look at things like what is the summer strategy and the winter strategy of the army and nothing more than that. Today, we are, we are miles beyond that. We are looking at the all-of-government approach. We are looking at the ideological aspects. We are looking at fifth-generation warfare and how to counter it. So there are a lot of things happening. So the negatives will be there. If the question for us is how can the positives outweigh the negatives? And the positives, I think, are catching on because of the much, much better understanding which is taking place both at the center and the state. The Ultimate test will be when the politics come into being. At the moment, we are we've got the center which is controlling and looking after the state administrator. It is when the politics of the state come back. And you 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 seen what has happened yesterday. You saw Dr. Farooq Abdullah what he spoke. I, I mean I mean these are the uh, maverick kind of things which will emerge from time to time. And he still remains a mainstream politician. The National Conference is very much a mainstream party uh, at the moment. So. These are the challenges which will remain there. They will have to be outweighed by the positive things which you will, the positive footprint which you bring uh, to Kashmir from time to time. As far as the four-point formula was concerned, um, there are very good uh, um, diplomats here who will give me give you far better responses to it. Uh, but as a as a military strategist, I would say it was a brave attempt. It was an initiative on the part of, uh, of Parvez Musharraf, no doubt, a change of heart, particularly after Agra, after the parliament attack. And seeing the goodness of the heart of a man like Atal Bihari Vajpayee, perhaps the, the profound uh, effect that uh, Vajpayee Sahib had on Musharraf, and Musharraf's probable understanding, which led to the ceasefire of uh, 2003, uh, the probable understanding that perhaps with the, a stable line of control, uh, the two sides could actually come to some kind of a meet, meeting, eye to eye meeting, in which uh, a solution could be found. Now, this aspect of uh, making the line of control a permanent line, uh, making it fuzzy at the same time, uh, allowing the, the Kashmiris and the Jammuites to be able to travel across each other without passports, the kind of thing which happened in 2005 uh, with the opening of the Muzaffarabad Road, uh, and things of this nature which was all a part of the four-point formula, uh, I think to me was uh, premature for one, uh, profoundly out of sync with the times. Because at the same time, if you remember from 2004 to 2008, that you saw this four to five years of effort, while you found the footprint, the stamp error coming down, 
It was not because Pakistan was reducing it. It was because the Indian Army and the Indian security system was forcing it to reduce it. And uh, Pakistan continued its activities. I mean, infiltration continued. Nothing changed. Those 42 terror camps remained. It is not as if Pakistan made any great uh, to us at that particular time. And it all ended with 2611. Right. Um, knows if this kind of an activity was being planned by a group, by, by the lashkar e taiba in which 165 people were killed and Pakistan could not take ownership of it, where was the fourth four point? Where was the seriousness of the fourth point? That's what I, I would say. Although we had a back and forth, a lot of diplomacy which was going on, but I still look at it as very, very unrealistic. Not to say that it can't happen again. It can happen. I say Pakistan has to completely, completely ensure that um, it does away with the whole idea of terror being a weapon in this entire strategic game. So many lives have been lost, and I think India has, we've seen 30 years, we've seen the water flowing down the Jhelum. I don't think we can, we can, uh, and talk and, and uh, four point formula and things like that coming together to or, or, on, 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 on the same platform. Uh, as far as the uh, Uh, that is to say, the localization of discuss. Yes, uh, I have was in Kashmir at the time when this transition was taking place in 2010, 11, 12. Uh, one one uh, uh, generation was going away, led by Sayyid Salahuddin, the Hezbollah Mujahideen, which was the most prominent local organization. Uh, by that time, the Lashkar e Taiba had also started locally uh, because infiltration was becoming a problem uh, at that time. And uh, therefore, a lot of locals had joined up with the lashkar e taiba also as against the uh, previous times but it is around 2013 or so when it 14 or so when it started really taking off once again when you found the new element the new generation coming into the leadership who were resisting the the orders and the presence and the control of uh, people like sayyid salahuddin or the united jihad council sitting in in muzaffarabad perhaps uh, uh, 2016 the killing of uh, Burhan Wani was definitely a landmark event. Uh, it spurred the Indian establishment into taking greater control. Because you found by 2016, it was 2016 was a very important year. If I can just remind you of the events. First of um, January, the Pathan court attack post the visit of Mr. Modi to Lahore. Imagine that was the kind of feed, the kind of uh, the, the, uh, the feedback that we got from from uh, Pakistan. Thereafter, you had um, the killing of Burhan Wani on the 8th of July. You had the Uri attack on the 18th of September. You had the surgical strikes on the 27th, 28th of September. You had the Nagrota attack on the 29th of November. The series of events which took place in 2016. At the end of the year was one of those strange years in which the uh, kill pattern, uh, which is the, the number of terrorists you kill, the number of terrorists killed to the number of... Uh, the casualties suffered by the security forces was one is to one, which was never heard of in the last 30 years. And I think I think that it really led us to let the establishment to take stock of the situation, uh, carry out this famous operation called Operation All Out. Although it was essentially a uh, soldier on terrorist, policeman on terrorist kind of a approach, but we brought down the footprint. We brought down the footprint. That even today, 180 terrorists have been killed in this particular year, despite COVID and despite everything. Intelligence has been better. Most of them appear to have, have been terrorists. We have taken measures such as uh, we, have, we have stopped giving back bodies of the foreign terrorists. Then we took a decision to stop giving back bodies of the local terrorists because these were events which were leading to the recreation of a tremendous amount of emotions in the in the local young local people uh, uh, but it doesn't seem because recruitment is all the reduction of recruitment has taken place but it is still going on it is still going on i do believe that the 180 terrorist kill the large footprint you're seeing of anti-terror operations in the valley is more because of improved intelligence than anything else right it's not because of enhanced uh, recruitment uh, there is a tremendous effort going on with the security establishment and the government for outreach. Now, I think the best example of that is this mistake made by the uh, army and the admitting admission of that mistake of those three 
uh, innocence in Shupia. It is the Lieutenant Governor of Kashmir, Mr. Um, uh, Sinha, who's personally gone to meet the families in Shupia. It's never been done before. I, I have never seen the Governor of Kashmir going to meet uh, uh, people like this, where, where the Thurman has suffered due to the security forces. So I do think the right uh, the right optics are all there, and it's a matter of time. But it, you have to give it a lot of time. It's not something which can work overnight. A sentiment to capture the sentiment back, it's going to take a fair amount of time. The ISI's efforts will always be there to try and uh, infuse more strength, more terrorist and attempts are going on in North Kashmir in particular. Let me tell you at this time, even as we are speaking, there are more efforts going on to bring more terrorism to North Kashmir because North Kashmir is under easier control uh, of the ISI. Uh, they are also trying to gravitate some of the local terrorists from South Kashmir towards North Kashmir at the moment. They're overcoming the problem of finances to a very large extent, but through, through the drug networks. And if you see most of this year, the biggest um, news making issue uh, in the, on the security front is the number of halls of uh, the large halls of drugs because this is what is acting as the new conduit for for, for moment of money uh, into the valley so there's there's a thing within a thing with a system within a system which keeps working like this the the army the the establishment has to understand the complexities of this and just can't take a step back as far as china is concerned and this is a very very important issue i I was of the uh, belief in the beginning that China was into this all alone, uh, that it was uh, looking at Ladakh, it was looking at this issue at this time as a new narrative, potentially for the post-pandemic uh, world order, etc. But it had brought in troops, it was attempting to coerce us, but at the end of the day, I do realize now, the Chinese never brought sufficient strength of troops to be able to do a campaign style operation. They could not have captured territory from us anywhere. By the time we built up, and we built up rather fast, we, by the time we built up 40,000 troops into, into Ladakh, today I don't think in the current situation China is in a position to capture territory uh, from us uh, uh, anywhere. But China is doing something which is different, and it is China is fighting almost the same way that Pakistan has been fighting us for the last 30 years, and that's the hybrid way. It's coercing us on the, on the line of actual control it will never finalize the line of actual control for long but it will keep us pegged to the ground it will keep uh, sending us messages it will try and ruin our economy if it can it will force us to keep mobilizing from time to time and not to play a little legitimate role that india as a reasonably big power emerging power needs to play in the indo pacific for example in the regional, regionally, even that China is not comfortable because it knows that India is virtually like a swing state. India looks at Pakistan, it looks at the United States, looks at Japan, and this is one equation the Chinese are very uncomfortable with. China, um, um, Japan, India, United States. And now you're finding the quad emerging out of it. So I don't think that the Chinese, the Chinese are essentially trying very hard to make sure that the confidence that we have gained over the last five, six years, the strategic confidence that India has gained in being able to take major decisions on its own, uh, things like uh, Doklam, being able to resist in Doklam, all this, it, it can neutralize to an extent by forcing India to retract and uh, mentally, psychologically take a back step. That it has not succeeded in doing it. It was particularly worried that what is happening in Gilgit Baltistan and with India's statements going on in Gilgit Baltistan, etc., it would be a matter of time before India would attempt to do something. And I think this is where the China Pakistan collusivity has really come together in a, in a big way. The last part of the question Will uh, India succeed in uh, getting back any of those lost areas? I mean, we never lost them that way. But uh, they were occupied by Pakistan, Gilgit Baltistan, the Shaksgam Valley, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, uh, to my mind, even, even Aksai Chin, all the territories which come under the 22nd Fe February 1994 umbrella. Militarily, with Pakistan and China in cahoots with each other, I doubt that war fighting, conventional war fighting, is a solution to the regaining of those territories. 
it would mean it would obviously mean a much larger war which would probably spread all along the northern borders all along the western borders and why this we've got presence of so many naval people here luminaries here it would spread totally into the maritime and this, this would be a bogus model i think as it so i think it has if if at all we are aspiring for it and i hope we are aspiring for it it has to be done the more subtle way and that is uh, the covert way the economic way uh, i don't know whether uh, pakistan is looking at gilgit baltistan and the development of gilgit baltistan with the support of china that this is a territory which is, is in chinese interest also investment huge investments to improve the quality of life of the people etc i don't think is happening driver basha dam is coming up there that's okay that's one big investment but i don't think the benefits of that are going to go to the people in any way what we need to look at is the creation of a model in jammu and kashmir itself the creation of such a superb economic social model in jammu and kashmir that uh, no one in gilgit baltistan pakistan occupied kashmir would want to be a part of those territories and uh, uh, they would always aspire to be here that is where our that is where the the understanding of this conflict needs to be brought clearly home that uh, it will have to be the hybrid way and the hybrid doesn't mean always violent hybrid can have covert operations limits of violence and of course a lot of socio political economic uh, aspects uh, being brought together so that's the way i look at it in terms of reality i tell you otherwise the street view is always that uh, we've got an army of 1.3 million we've got a big navy we've got an air force uh, we've got so many central armed police forces why can't we go into gilgit baltistan and and just capture it events if they had to happen so easily they would have happened many many years thank you thank you so uh, there are some more questions and uh, this question is about uh, the in political elite in pakistan uh what has been india's strategy to change the ideology of political elite in pakistan and uh, uh, do we have a strategy if so please shed some light on it okay any, any other questions yes yes there are many questions but let, i'm trying to first read myself yeah uh, there is you, see, you have talked a lot about uh, uh, hybrid war uh and so and you also touched upon it but i think they want to know uh more specifically uh what are uh, what is india's strategy to uh come to this hybrid war which pakistan is uh, has launched and uh, in this connection there is also a question uh, what are the initiatives uh, the uh, government has taken to reach out to the people of uh, kashmir Okay, I'll try and come. I think these are very good questions. Uh, well away from the um, military domain, and uh, that is why it's very important because I do believe that half the problem of Jammu and Kashmir, more than half the problem of Jammu and Kashmir, is outside the military domain. Uh, the military domain has been, to my mind, very greatly recaptured by us over a period of time. We've lost it many times because of the lack of initiative. Uh, we didn't have political initiatives coming but it seems that we are on the cusp of uh, something important something interesting which is taking place at the at the moment so having said that to start with the first question the aspect of ideology of pakistan will friend uh, uh, explain to you, state is in control of pakistan the deep state should have learned by now that uh, pandering to radicalism pandering to extremist ideology and philosophy has only its bounce back which is what i think at one time hillary clinton had also advised pakistan about having snakes in its backyard if you remember but despite that despite fighting um zarbe azb fighting um, that famous uh, uh, internal thing which i'm forgetting uh, adul fasad the operation dadul fasad i mean successfully fighting these operations despite having events such as the attack on the uh, army public school where you lost 139 children of army personnel despite all this pakistan has not learned its lesson the deep state has not learned its lesson it continues to believe that it can control 
that it can it can use this ideology its advantage against its enemies but it can control it within i think this is a fallacy which um, the unfortunately the world doesn't come together to explain the uh, fatf at the moment is making bold gestures attempts to do it but to my mind the fatf uh, the constitution of the fatf is such you are saying if uh, three nations get together then you can't put it on the blacklist you need 12 nations to pull it out of the gray list i mean deal the kind of things the actual ground reality of what is happening i uh, will see it on the 22nd 23rd of october what the family does i'm sure it will keep them on the gray list it won't take it uh, anywhere else but pakistan obviously continues to remain important by this and uh, when i say pakistan it means the deep state continues to remain emboldened by this and india is a lone voice it has got the pakistan has got the support of china and as i explained to you the map in the beginning its uh, geostrategic location is such that uh, if the americans can go up to 70% 80% but they can't go the whole way the whole way so they can't they they, they can't sort of put it into the uh, on the black list and say that okay you are declared hereby declared a, a a terrorist supporting state the americans can't do it and they won't do it uh, the saudis have been very very cooperative way has been very cooperative what you're seeing is just a schism which has been created in the oic otherwise they got the support of turkey iran uh, malaysia to an extent maybe indonesia so uh, i think our lonely voice at the moment all the diplomatic efforts are always on i will say that uh, perhaps we need to make even greater diplomatic efforts internationally uh, where our presence if our presence in again you know in uh, our opinion in various institutions around the world important institutions around the world must be heard must be felt i do believe strongly that uh, we have made great diplomatic efforts we have made huge military efforts on our side but our psychological warfare efforts have been constrained due to lack of understanding i don't think the establishment in india has really clearly understood the whole the role of psychological warfare which we need to go into a little more a little deeper and that is why i think uh, uh, the, the uh, ideology of uh, pakistan we uh, despite our very bold efforts that we have been making in the recent years will take us much much longer to completely succeed uh, as far as this understanding of how the counter hybrid war is concerned i don't know whether if any of you have read i i i have written a three part series recently two of them appeared in the new indian express one of them appeared yesterday yesterday's piece talks about counter hybrid war against chinese efforts in ladakh and the, the current situation completely if you get hold of it kindly do read it but the the start point of any counter hybrid war is is an understanding that every domain has to be fought in you can't say that pakistan is fighting me Uh, in the military domain in the ideological domain but i will fight him only in the military domain you have to fight him in every single the all of government approach where bureaucracy has to understand it the police forces have to understand it intelligence as it is understands it but probably has to understand it in a more modernistic way the army has to understand it in a more modernistic way and this is where the intellectual aspect of conflict comes in very strong hybrid war is not just a war of the street it's not just a war of the soldier against the soldier it is a it is a far greater intellectual activity it needs an academic support i would say an institution like vivekananda international foundation which spots such amazing people uh, in the middle of it is always in the in the throes of this attempting to do this at all times understanding it and then the contribution of vif towards the understanding of hybrid war has been phenomenal actually in india there are very few organizations in india which actually have that uh, correct understanding but on the ground manifestation in kashmir jammu and kashmir uh, unfortunately over a period of time it hasn't it hasn't taken that level of uh, of serious seriousness of course everyone is involved the understanding is the aspect. more important aspect is the understanding and a creation of a strategy and then the monitoring it monitoring it over a period of time with a long term uh, aim and a short term mid term long term short term aim all worked out for example um, as a very very crude example if i can tell you if someone asked me in 2011 uh, as your as the core commander what is your 
aim in Kashmir. I would say my long term aim in Kashmir is nothing but to mainstream the state, the people, as I mean, you say the state, it's the people, mainstream the state of Jammu and Kashmir with the rest of India in the political, social, economical, economic and psychological domain. Four domains. Out of these four domains, the psychological is the most important. And I used to, whenever I used to talk about this to people, visitors coming to me and anywhere else, I used to at the end have a byline to say, let Jai Hind be your message. Which means that the, when, the, when, when the local person comes up to you and wishes you, Assalamu Alaikum Jai Hind, you have actually won the conflict that day. This is the way to approach hybrid war. Changing the message, changing the way people think. And think positively for the country. That's the way out. Uh, as far as the uh, the last uh, question was, uh, the uh, I can't read my own handwriting. What was the last one, sir? Uh, let me see. What In was the last one? Initiatives. Uh, initiatives. Uh, what, are, what are the initiatives uh, that have uh, been oh. taken to yes. uh, outreach on the outreach yeah. to the Kashmiri people? That, that's a very important thing. And, uh, and I think, let me just take, spend three minutes to try and explain this. And I'm running out of time. I've got four minutes left in the Okay. Yeah. You see, it's a very important aspect that anywhere in the world where counterinsurgency, counterterrorist operations have been fought by the military, it starts what is called a military civic action. That means you combine your military operations along with doing something for the people to soften the blow. Often it happens that because the territory in, under, in which you are fighting, is also not under the administrative control of the local administration. The army is the only set of people who can go there and actually bring succor to the people. For example, hospitals. You will not find more in, in the early 90s, you'll find most of the hospitals, the doctors had run away, there were no specialists and things like that. Why did the army undertake this whole business of uh, conducting medical camps? This was part of our outreach. Because we were this local administration didn't have the capability, the army started doing. Now, when the situation is well under control administratively, the army takes a back foot. Army only facilitates. It facilitates the administration to what the army was doing earlier, which means essentially good governance reaches out to the people and no one has now the excuse to say there is too much of terrorist activity and terrorist threat and things like that. It is the army which facilitates this. Entire. I can give you an example that in 2011, I attempted to do it by going to the people and conduct a couple of meetings with them. And I slowly realized that there was no need for me to go and speak there because I could do nothing for them. It is the local administration. It is the local politician. It is the local, the local people who had to do something for them. So I made use of the platform that I was creating where I was giving the security. I was putting up the flags and I was putting up the Shamiana to speak to people. I said, instead of me coming to speak there, let me be there in presence, but let me bring the local DC, let me bring the local MLA, let yeah. me bring the local member of parliament. Let them all come in here. And that way, what happens is there's a one-to-one -one between the people. I think that has started once again. I'm glad yeah. to see that is happening once again. And now every element of the bureaucracy has to see itself as the, as the, as the, as the, as the agent of change in Kashmir. Lots and lots of governance activities have started in terms of uh, skill development for people, etc. Of course, the young people are still very, very disappointed. But I know because of COVID-19, the situation at the moment is such. I am very confident. We hope yeah. to see the end of the pandemic and we hope to see greater dynamism in the overall concept of outreach to the people. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General Hasnain, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, you have uh, in that presentation through your uh, various slides uh, clarified the basic concepts about the situation in uh, Jammu and Kashmir and how Pakistan comes in a big way and now uh, a factor China, which is becoming even uh, uh, more important. And of course, you talked about uh, 370 and uh, you also talked about the new trends, particularly how this uh, uh, information warfare or uh, gray zone conflicts or uh, you know, whatever you might call it. But uh, this is becoming an extremely uh, big challenge. And in fact, uh, dealing with Kashmir uh, today, 
is now there are much more many more factors that we have to deal with uh, than was the case say uh, 10 years ago uh, because of the change in uh, the geopolitical environment and also the uh, environment in the region so i'm sure uh, there were many more questions actually some excellent questions but we can't uh, take them up uh, uh, because of the shortage of time but the q and a has also been uh, very lively so uh, let us thank uh, general hasnan for his time and uh, for his uh, uh, presentation thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much okay so uh, now we are going to our uh, uh, second session which uh, promises to be uh, equally rewarding and uh, that is uh, by uh, a, a talk by saval uh, 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 some students here uh, who is with us uh, welcome sir uh, this is a course uh, that we organize uh, every year and you have spoken in the previous uh, uh, editions also and uh, the number of people here who have uh, who are joining us for the first time and they are from different walks of life some of them are also from abroad and uh, they would very much like to uh, understand the uh, key features attributes of uh, india's foreign policy uh, as it is uh, developing uh, in this changed geopolitical environment uh for the participants uh, 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 a brief introduction uh, to abhijit uh, kaval sibal uh, he is uh, uh, the member of the advisory council of the uh, vif and uh, he has been a former uh, foreign secretary a veteran diplomat uh, he has uh, served in many countries and he was an ambassador in russia france turkey and uh, he is uh, a, a a leading uh, commentator a uh, columnist and writes on uh, issues of foreign policy and uh, security he is uh, one of the top commentators in the country today so uh, we are uh, very honored to have him uh, with us so so we'll uh, uh, conduct this uh, uh, in the following way uh, you could make your remarks in about uh, 45 minutes and leave about half an hour for uh, q and a and uh, the q and a will uh, the questions will be in the chat box and i'll pick up a few questions and uh, put it up to you uh, it may not be possible to answer all the questions but we'll try and group them in some uh, headings and then you could react so that uh, q and a will be about half an hour so with those words uh, i request you to kindly make it <clears throat> thank you arvin uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, i hope uh, what i say would be found uh, rewarding by those who are listening in because the subject is evolving challenges for india's foreign and security policies uh, much uh, is written about this uh, by lots of experts uh, there isn't always a consensus uh, on this because uh, we have now today uh, not a full consensus on uh, government's uh, foreign policy uh, but nevertheless uh, for people who like me and you and others uh, who have uh, studied indian foreign policy practiced it analyzed it thought about it uh, we can uh, usefully give our perspectives and i'll try to uh, do that now in terms of uh, evolving challenges um, you know the geopolitical landscape uh for india has changed uh, in uh, recent years uh, quite dramatically india for example has become much closer uh, to the united states although for most part of our independent life we had great difficulties with the united states and the united states was in fact the country as i have said before which uh, did the most damage to india's strategic interests by sanctioning us by denying us technology and putting all other kinds of pressure pressures on us but today uh, the situation has uh, changed dramatically uh, we have very good understanding with the united states i am told uh, by uh, people that i would trust them who are in position of power that in the current uh, ladakh uh, crisis uh, united states is uh, giving us uh, very good support uh, they have become our biggest uh, single country economic 
uh, and technology partner. Uh, trade has gone up to 142 point some billion dollars, including services, of course. Uh, and what is remarkable is that uh, we now have a burgeoning defense ties with the United States, which is an area uh, which in the past uh, has been problematic for us. And it's not as if uh, this is still without problems uh, because of the US system, but the trust levels between the two sides have grown to such an extent that in a few years we have uh, ordered about purchase of $18 billion worth of defense equipment from the United States in critical areas, which are now proving to be very handy and useful in what is happening in Ladakh. Uh, at the same time, Russia, which was always our most trusted and uh, tried partner, and whom, uh, unlike in the case of uh, some of our other partners, the summit level engagement has been unbroken, unbroken for almost 20 years. Uh, and it remains a, a key defense partner. And now we are exploring energy partnership uh, with Russia. But nevertheless, the relationship with Russia as it does not now have the same uh, fundamental salience for India's foreign policy as was the case in the, in the past. Uh, one, that Russia has become weaker after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and even more so and even uh, more. Uh, lately by uh, all the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia. Uh, the Russian economy is not doing uh, 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 too well. Uh, they have lost uh, some ground in India in the area uh, of uh, defense. And at the same time, uh, the equation between India and Russia has changed because India has, has become uh, relatively much stronger. In fact, our economy is much larger than that of Russia, with 3 trillion versus about 1.7 or 2 trillion dollars of Russia. Uh, the other factor factor that impinges on uh, foreign policy is that if we have become closer to the United States, Russia has become closer to China. Um, so uh, this has uh, affected uh, the, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, the kind of trilateral relationship and the balances within that trilateral relationship, uh, which Russia has been, has been promoting uh, for uh, uh, several years. Russia, even though it may not uh, admit it, uh, is seen from the outside as having become a junior partner uh, of China. Uh, the equation between Russia, India, and China uh, within the RIC forum, which was promoted by Russia as a, as a kind of a, a counter to West domination and, and having a platform where these three major countries uh, could uh, uh, try and influence global thinking on uh, international governance and also try and uh, build uh, a synergy uh, amongst them, uh, which would uh, help in shifting more uh, the power from the West uh, towards the, the, the East. Uh, now, Russia, China uh, are much closer strategically, whatever the underlying suspicions that may exist. Uh, uh, and Russia relationship has become uh, has become uh, weaker. Um, in BRICS too, which again was a platform which we joined because uh, for of support for multipolarity uh, and uh, and uh, as a kind of a counter to U.S. Uh, unilateralism, which was at its height then. Uh, and again, in terms of reforming inter international. Uh, political and uh, uh, economic system, uh, BRICS was created as a kind of uh, an alternative. Now, within BRICS also, uh, the equations have changed. Uh, China is, is by far, with its enormous financial resources, and the leading partner. Uh, and so if there's any, any economic agenda in, in BRICS, uh, the, the, the real player is China whether it's the New Development Bank uh, or... And of course, if you look at uh, the trajectory of China, I don't think they need uh, BRICS anymore. I mean, their, uh, their global uh, influence and, uh, and the 
means that they have deployed to expand their global influence. Now it doesn't need uh, forums like BRICS. They have the BRI, which is uh, totally outside uh, any, any multilateral forum. And that is the most important vehicle uh, for uh, the expansion of uh, Chinese uh, influence. Similarly, in the SEO, which we join again uh, in terms of you know having a balance of our in our foreign policy and not be seen as totally in the Chi in the Western camp or the U.S. camp. There in uh, um, China's uh, domination of Eurasia and uh, its economic linkages with the Central Asian states far exceed what Russia uh, does. Uh, of course, Russia in, on security terms still uh, has the upper hand. Uh, and China is careful about not uh, creating suspicions in this area in Russian mind. But nevertheless, the reality on the ground is uh, uh, what it is. Uh, the other thing is that uh, while we try to maintain this balance and we nurture our relationship with uh, uh, Russia, which is very important, uh, we have the problem that as our relationship with the United States is becoming closer, um, the United States uh, is interfering in our relationship with Russia. This is a collateral consequence of our closer ties with the United States because U.S.-Russia relations have deteriorated to such extent that uh, it becomes a pressure point on us to maintain the closeness of our ties with Russia uh, and at the same time uh, adjust ourselves a little bit here and there uh, to the uh, very uh, serious de deterioration of U.S.-Russia uh, ties. And Katsa is a good example of that, where uh, the U.S. Uh, has tried to prevent us from uh, purchasing the S-400, uh, but we've gone ahead, even at the risk of potential sanctions. They may or may not come. But nevertheless, a tough decision that the government then has to take of... Uh, uh, of countering uh, negative opinion in the U.S. administration and Congress, and at the same time making sure that President Putin doesn't get the impression that we have lost independence of our foreign policy and will be guided by the United States, even in a, as vital a relationship as we have uh, with uh, uh, with Russia. Um, now, India has faces the challenge since we're talking about evolving challenges, is to create a new balance in our foreign policy, which is that we continue to benefit from closer India-US ties, continue to nurture India-Russia ties, continue to operate on uh, platforms such as BRICS, RIC, uh, SEO, uh, so that uh, uh, our international profile uh, doesn't get uh, diluted or reduced uh, by being absent from these uh, forums, which have their own importance in terms of the geographical area they cover. And at the same time, uh, we uh, subscribe to the concept of the Indo-Pacific uh, and uh, as uh, and Quad uh, as uh, new pillars of uh, our foreign policy. Uh, there is some, uh, I won't say criticism, or maybe there's criticism, or at least there's some reflection here and there uh, as to why doesn't India uh, be clear why this in its choices, why does it continue to hedge, why does it want to on all forum and get the full confidence of uh, neither of the forum of none of the forums that we are we are in. I think this is, uh, to my mind, uh, not valid criticism at all. Uh, India, uh, by virtue of its uh, humongous size, uh, whether it's population or geography or now economy, and, that, and the economy will grow and human capital. And of course, uh, and I think we should all uh, believe in that, uh, as a civilization, we are amongst the oldest in the world and have made tremendous contributions to global civilization. So we can't act like a small country with little future and which has to depend on others uh, for uh, playing uh, its due role on the global stage. And therefore, we have to, even if our resources currently are limited and our dependencies in certain areas are, critic, are actually subcritical in terms of pursuing an independent foreign policy, but the goal of pursuing an independent foreign policy 
taking into account the fact that globalization has created certain uh, networks and conditions under which no country can be fully independent in inverted commas in foreign policy. But nevertheless, within those limits, we have to uh, maintain uh, what I still support, what is called strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy should not be confused with uh, uh, non-alignment. Non-alignment uh, was, in fact, in some ways, uh, strategic autonomy, yes, but in a particular context. But in today's context, strategic autonomy means something very different, which is that a more confident and, uh, and stronger India is willing to establish partnerships uh, all around what is called multi-alignment <laughs> by some, that we will not shy away uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, making our presence uh, known and felt in, in various uh, international uh, forums and not be like Japan or uh, uh, South Korea or any of the allies of the United States, even Europe, uh, lose uh, that kind of uh, independence of maneuver. You would notice that uh, even in Europe, in a country like France, in its official statements, talks about strategic autonomy. Now, if uh, an ally of the United States, member of NATO, still feels that uh, there is scope and need to pursue uh, an independent foreign policy and have strategic autonomy, then all the more reason that India uh, should also not give up uh, that uh, uh, objective. But how to maintain this strategic autonomy uh, is, is a constant exercise. Uh, it's, it's not as if uh, we say that we have strategic autonomy and then by virtue of having stated, we can pursue it. It has to be exercised. It has to be exercised in concrete ways. And one uh, uh, exercise of this which struck me was the fact that uh, en route to the SCO meeting in Moscow, uh, both the external affairs minister and the defense minister stopped over in Tehran. And this at a time when China is sitting in Ladakh and posing a military threat to us and where American support in various ways uh, is very important and for that matter uh, of the Western world in, in general, uh, we decided that uh, we would not shy away from making a, a political, diplomatic uh, and even a military gesture uh, to uh, Tehran, to Iran. Uh, now, for the foreign ministers to stop there, I can still understand because you know, foreign ministers sort of uh, have this vocation of uh, meeting each other and uh, it's part of a normal diplomatic effort. But the defense minister stopping there in the context of uh, U.S., uh, uh, how should I say, um, determination to bring Iran down, down on its knees. And uh, even in the past, when I've been in position, the uh, United States has been very, very, uh, very you know, has been putting pressure on us and, and monitoring very closely uh, what we do uh, with Iran in, 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 the, in terms of uh, the defense. The another reason why I think uh, we have to be uh, watchful about uh, not putting our eggs into any uh, single basket because the United States uh, under Trump has become unpredictable, isolationist. Uh, even he, he, he is spurning his allies, as you know. Um, Europe is upset uh, with him. Um, now, if the allies cannot count on the United States for their security, then India certainly cannot count on it uh, for uh, its security beyond a certain point. And then, of course, the economic ties with the United States. Uh, are always disturbed by U.S. Uh, corporate lobbies uh, pursuing their limited interests and the White House and the uh, U.S. administration in general and, and the Congress not able uh, to take a strategic view of uh, economic ties with India uh, and uh, release pressure on India rather than uh, uh, sanctioning India by withdrawing GST, not GST, GSP, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so while we go ahead and uh, uh, continue to establish stronger ties with the United States, we have to be also uh, cognizant of the, of the uh, difficulties. The other is U.S. policy in Afghanistan. Now, this is going to be a big challenge for us. Now, we can understand why the United States wants to withdraw uh, from Afghanistan. 
it's been a losing war which has cost the uh, united states billions of dollars and so many thousands of lives uh, and with no satisfactory end result uh, but then uh, us policy of uh, treating afghan as a legitimate uh, force not as a, a terrorist force even when on the ground while the negotiations are going on the taliban is engaging in the most vicious kind of terrorist violence this says a lot about the us cynicism with regard to its war on terrorism when, when it is dealing with when it is giving respect uh, to to the uh, to the taliban and to my mind uh, sooner rather than later uh, taliban is likely to take over and uh, when it does it will be a huge problem for the region huge problem for the region because there will be spillover effects of islamic terrorism from afghanistan no matter what is being said at present and if the united states takes the position that their agreement with the taliban is that they will not target united states and its allies so the subtext of this is that uh, they are free to attack india because india is not an ally so we are not protected uh, by this uh, kind of an agreement and down the line by giving pakistan the kind of role that uh, the united states has given uh, to it in afghanistan and given pakistan determination uh, to keep india out of afghanistan uh, we have a problem ahead and this problem is related to the overall us uh, foreign policy in 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 afghanistan uh, no, not that they are doing this uh, deliberately to vex india it just is that uh, in in this strategic area we don't have a a convergence of uh, thinking and uh, views uh, problems with pakistan uh, are not going to go away on the contrary uh, uh, unless uh, something totally unexpected happens this is not likely uh, pakistan will become more and more of a problem and i will explain why one is that uh, pakistan is feeling more and more emboldened because of its uh, linkage to china and uh, with deterioration deteriorating china india ties the china pakistan ties will become even stronger even stronger and this explains why imran khan uh, uh, started taunting through Qureshi, or not Imran Khan personally, but Qureshi, uh, backed by the Pakistan military, started taunting Saudi Arabia. They feel strong enough that they have this Chinese backing, and China will bail them out. And therefore, while uh, they have been traditionally dependent on Saudi Arabia for economic survival and for economic dole-outs, they somehow seem to feel that uh, uh, they can uh, find some elbow room in dealing with Saudi Arabia and increase and ask the saudis for increased price if they want pakistani uh, support uh, for the uh, uh, saudi monarchy uh, i think uh, not only pakistan but uh, even uh, uh, other parts of the sunni world including turkey they are upset with mohammed bin salman because of the reforms he's bringing about and doing things which are considered haram by the islamists um, so um, I think this renewed confidence uh, that Pakistan may have is going to be a problem for us. Now, insofar as the European Union is concerned, uh, as as you know, as a as a as a collect as a, a organization, as an institution, or as a group of countries, the EU EU is our biggest economic uh, trade and technology partner. Uh, but uh, when it comes to security issues, but let me first say something else, which is that uh, we've not been able to do an FTA. You know, EU is an economic animal, essentially, although it's trying to acquire uh, a, a, some kind of common foreign and security policy, but it hasn't yet uh, crystallized uh, to the degree that uh, uh, they would aspire to. Uh, but it's an economic animal. And uh, therefore, uh, the fact that we've not been able to sign an FTA uh, with uh, Europe, while they've done one with Japan uh, and with Canada, uh, it, it just goes to show that uh, uh, a lot of work needs to be done in order to uh, build that kind of relationship with the European Union, especially today with the uh, global supply chains trying to move out of uh, China and we wanting to attract those supply chains. Uh, 
getting Europe onto our side economically becomes important. More so as Germany, Germany's relationship with the China economically is very deep. And although there are some signs that Germany is now trying to be a little more upfront in terms of its concerns about China, but Germany is divided. Its uh, corporate sector is uh, divided. And uh, it's very difficult for Germany. If you look at the volume of trade that they have, uh, uh, to, to uh, not give primacy to its economic ties with China, even as it tries to find some elbow room in terms of building a European uh, consensus against China, which is happening. But on the security side, uh, Europe is not in a position to do very much uh, for us, for our problems. Uh, they are not in the Indo-Pacific in any, um, uh, barring, except France, I'll come to that. They're not present in the Indo-Pacific area in any significant way, certainly not militarily uh, in, any, uh, in any serious way. And when it comes to our land threat from China, uh, Europe is, uh, is, is not really in a position to help. Uh, though I was struck by the fact, and it's important symbolically, that when, uh, the, when, the first, when, when the first batch of Rafales came, the French defense minister uh, came to India. Uh, by, and, by, and our press has been touting uh, the Rafale, and even officially we've been touting Rafale as some kind of a big game changer. It's a bit immature on our part uh, to do this. But the fact that uh, we have overtly in India tried to project the acquisition of Rafale as a force builder against China for the French defense minister to wade into this uh, and uh, indirectly send a signal uh, to China that they are supporting India's defense uh, uh, capability is important. Now, France is an exception because France considered, considers itself an Indian Ocean and an Indo-Pacific power. Uh, they have interests in the Western, in the Pacific Ocean, and they have big interests in the Western Indian Ocean because of reunion. And as I understand uh, that uh, there are some serious forms of cooperation that uh, India and France are engaging in, in terms of uh, this maritime security in the Western Indian Indian uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but, uh, now, in, I've spoken a little bit about uh, the Gulf, but uh, in terms of uh, evolving challenges, I think we have to keep in mind that the Gulf is becoming more and more and more unstable. Uh, the kind of developments that have taken place there cannot uh, give us a sense of assurance that things will not become worse than they are. Um, now, the fact that uh, Israel has made such a, such a success in terms of, we, uh, of drawing to them itself with American help, key Arab countries like UAE and uh, Bahrain, uh, with obviously the blessing of uh, Saudi Arabia, is a game changer. It's really a game changer. Uh, how this will uh, uh, fuel uh, the Shia-Sunni divide and the Iran-Saudi Arabia divide. Uh, when I say Shia-Sunni, I have in mind uh, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, uh, Malaysia, uh, you know, on the Sunni network, finding some common ground um, uh, to, uh, to show their uh, opposition to trends in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and how that will uh, uh, impact uh, the potential for conflict, uh, what happens then to our very huge interests in terms of manpower and remittances and energy uh, from this area uh, is a challenge that we have to uh, worry about uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming years. We can't be sanguine that uh, simply because our relationship with Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE have uh, grown so well that this is a hedge against uh, any disturbance in the region and our interest in the in the region. So, uh, uh, to my mind, this is a bit of a question mark. We've done we've done well to diversify the source of energy. We are now importing oil and gas from thirty countries, so that we are not dependent uh, on uh, on the Gulf uh, for our energy supplies. Uh, our relationship with Israel, as you know, is going from strength to strength. The fact that they have managed to resolve uh, their, their fundamental hostility, um, 
with the Arab world is helpful to us in many ways uh, because uh, it opens up uh, some areas of collaboration between India and Israel, even in the uh, Arab world. Finally, not finally, uh, the biggest challenge is China's rise in expansionism. Uh, and the fact that they have engineered this crisis in, uh, in Ladakh deliberately uh, is uh, something that uh, we need to factor in very seriously in our uh, foreign policy. China clearly has uh, G2 ambitions. They don't make any bones of it. Uh, their whole agenda of uh, 49 uh, to become uh, a leading power in the world actually means that uh, they and the United States uh, will actually uh, be the principal powers and others will have to uh, adjust their foreign policy uh, to uh, this reality, this global uh, reality. Uh, their desire to dominate Asia is very clear. The whole BRI project is not only limited to Eurasia, of course, it has even bigger implications, uh, but uh, they, are in a, they are beginning to dominate uh, Asia. And once they do that, then they get the requisite base to then challenge the United States uh, even more. Their maritime ambitions, uh, we know, and these are going to become more problematic for us. Uh, they are in, in Myanmar and Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Pakistan in terms of maritime ports and uh, maritime uh, footholds uh, is, will be an increasing challenge in the background of the huge naval building uh, activity that is going on in China. As some are saying that uh, never before in history has any country uh, built, uh, devoted so much effort so quickly to build up such a large navy. So why are they building up this large navy? It's not for operating in the Western Pacific. It's too, too constricted an area and where the US 7th Fleet and US allies are there and where they're exposed. So clearly their ambitions are, as they have said, to protect their uh, uh, maritime lines of uh, uh, communication. Uh, and as they expand and get footholds and bases here and there, then they, they will uh, need a strong navy to be able to uh, protect their interests, and this creates a problem for us. This creates a problem for us, which means that we have to continue strengthening our Navy, devote much greater attention to maintain our uh, uh, current uh, uh, edge, edge over China in the Indian Ocean and not allow it to be diluted to the point where in, in, where in addition to the land challenge, we also then have to begin to worry about the uh, challenge uh, in the the oceans. Um, I think the CPEC, some say they've run into trouble. I don't know. Uh, I was told by, uh, by uh, an ambassador from this area yesterday, whom I met, that the work in Guadar is proceeding apace very, very rapidly. Very rapidly. Um, and soon I think they will have a naval base there. Uh, China is unwilling to resolve its border issue with us. It's very clear now uh, uh, the kind of uh, acts they have, the kind of action on the ground, and of course uh, uh, the kind of uh, how should I say uh, pro uh, positions they are taking with regard to the 1959 uh, line of actual Nehru rejected something which Nehru rejected can never be accepted by the BJP government in any case. Uh, so. Uh, we are also concerned about a potential two-front war, uh, which, uh, which, which we cannot rule out. Right? It may not be an all-out war, but even in a limited theater, it's, a, it's an issue for us. And we will have continue to have this problem of uh, two of our neighbors, both nuclear states, both claiming our territory, both collaborating with, the, with each other uh, and having an interest in confining India uh, as much as possible into the South Asian region and uh, slowing down its uh, global profile, uh, that's an issue that uh, we'll have to tackle with. Now, China is uh, destabilizing our relationship with our neighbors, and they are successfully doing that in Nepal, uh, where, uh, to my mind, Oli has become reckless and uh, is doing a lot of damage to India-Nepal uh, 
relations at the behest of China. Just like Pakistan gets emboldened because of China, even a small country like Nepal is getting emboldened uh, and taking on India. And what is astonishing to my mind is that when the Chinese have entered Ladakh and claiming Indian territory, at the same time, Nepal only goes ahead and starts claiming Indian territory. Uh, without any thought being given to the fact that this would look like some sort of collusion between Nepal and and uh, and China, and now China has roped in uh, Nepal into this uh, under the cover of COVID into this quadrilateral. What has Nepal got to do with, uh, with Pakistan, Afghanistan, or whichever country that uh, China has roped in? But uh, Nepal continues to to taunt us, and uh, it's become a big problem. Bangladesh. Yes, our relationship is very good, has never been better, uh, but there are underlying uh, problems in our ties with Bangladesh, as will always be the case uh, because of the structure of uh, a society and Islamic elements, and of course, China's penetration. It's the biggest defense partner of Bangladesh, and it is still trying to tempt Bangladesh with some huge projects, uh, maritime projects, which I hope uh, will not. Uh, materialize. Um, Maldives, we have recovered our position, uh, but we have continued to work very hard to um, ensure that uh, there is not a reversal or a dilution of the very positive position that Maldives has taken with, reg with regard to relationship with India, where this leadership is now saying uh, openly that uh, if, for them it is India first. Um, with the uh, Sri Lanka, I found, you, as you would have seen, that uh, young Cheche, or however you pronounce his name, uh, former foreign minister, now member of the, uh, ever, uh, yeah, they would know what that, I've forgotten what that, <laughs> what that uh, position is. But uh, he, uh, he just visited Sri Lanka, and there's an effort to retrieve uh, China's position there with the Rajapaksas who have come back. So we have to then to continue to deal with uh, this kind of challenge that we get from Sri Lanka. Uh, India is very wisely trying to, uh, as part of uh, uh, its uh, Indian Ocean policy, uh, giving uh, attention to IORA and, and, uh, and trying to uh, establish a network of uh, maritime security. Uh, this is a good thing in terms of uh, uh, asserting our uh, role in the Indian Ocean area in collaboration with the uh, literal uh, states. I think China and India have done very well to stand up to China and Ladakh as we have done. Uh, this is quite different from what uh, the US was unable to do or unwilling to do, and Japan is both un unable and willing, unwilling to do. And the ASEAN countries have also buckled under Chinese pressure. But Despite uh, all the problems that we have, uh, we've done uh, mirror deployment. If they have massed 40,000, 50,000, we have also massed 40,000. I think uh, this is brave on our part, courageous on our part, and sends a very powerful signal to China and the rest of the world that in not going to be browbeaten by China, even if there is a, a threat, secure, a threat of conflict. Uh, our neighborhood first policy seems to be getting some new wings. I was struck by the fact that uh, our foreign secretary was accompanied by the army chief to Myanmar, again, a critical country in terms of uh, China and the, and the ocean. Uh, we've taken a bold step in uh, beginning to close the doors uh, to China in our economy, uh, which is giving an example to others, uh, banning the applications uh, uh, vetting Chinese investments, uh, looking at uh, beneficiaries, ultimate beneficiaries, uh, and preventing, uh, uh, no, no, uh, get, uh, amending the rules so that there is no automatic uh, uh, approval for investments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We rejected RCEP, although there are differences uh, in thinking on this by many. Personally, I think it's a very good thing uh, because it's, a, it's basically a rejection of China. And I'm still surprised why all the other countries uh, want to uh, give China more economic space, even when China is creating serious political and security issues for them. For them, uh, but there it is. Uh, um, now, finally, and this is final. Uh, 
um, we have this challenge of trying to now benefit from, if you can, from the US-China uh, conflict that is burgeoning, uh, the uh, trade war and uh, the desire to move out uh, supply chains in critical areas from China. I think we this is an opportunity we must not lose. Whether we can gear up our domestic system uh, to take advantage of this reform, do the necessary reforms that are needed, uh, we will wait and we will we'll wait and uh, see. This whole effort of uh, self of uh, self reliance, uh, in the manner in which the prime minister has explained, uh, both in manufacturing and more importantly in defense manufacturing, is the right way to go. Uh, whether we succeed in this or not uh, remains to be seen again. I spoke to the American ambassador a few days ago uh, about uh, the fact that we now, the foreign companies can now put in 74%, uh, uh, can, can have 74% equity uh, in uh, whatever they, in their investment in India. Uh, but let's see uh, what, uh, what we get. But since we are developing our strategic defense ties with the United States, the uh, United States could play a role in terms of uh, uh, investing in India in order to help build up our sector. On climate change, uh, India has, uh, again, it's an issue with very important foreign policy ramifications. In fact, the other day I was told uh, that uh, the EU will not uh, sign an FTA with India unless there is, there is, a, provision, there is, a, there is a provision in it for uh, climate change. The climate change issue has to come in, but otherwise the European Parliament will never uh, 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 will never ratify uh, any any agreement. But on that, uh, Prime Minister has taken a lead both in terms of renewable energy program in India, the International Solar Alliance, uh, as well as this uh, uh, coalition for disaster resilient uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, all that is related to uh, climate. Change. Uh, so, so I so. So let me end by saying that uh, India is now much more active on the international stage, more confident about itself and the future, and uh, determined to secure itself by advances in strategic areas. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. See, it has been a uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, account of uh, the challenges India is facing. And uh, this has triggered a number of uh, questions. Uh, some of these you have already touched upon or answered uh, during the course of your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but there are some more specific questions. So we have about uh, another uh, half an hour for uh, Q&A. And uh, we could take uh, some of these questions. So I'll take them selectively because some of these, as I said, have uh, already been uh, touched upon. But this one question, uh, let me take a couple of questions uh, with regard to China. Uh, one is uh, uh, when China is not respecting our sovereignty, why are we respecting one China policy and are not vocal on Hong Kong and Taiwan? If you could elaborate a bit. Another question again relating to China is about uh, how, do, how do we respond to China's uh, BRI? Uh, another question about uh, China is uh, about uh, uh, regarding China, they are trying to create China-friendly academia and uh, sinologists by offering means of scholarship and funding uh, of think tanks, etc., especially in Nepal. So what are India's uh, options uh, with regard to that? I think on, on China, and then maybe related, uh, we can just take about, you could also comment on ASEAN centrality and what is India's view on South China Sea and ASEAN centrality. And then we'll come to some other set of questions. You know, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You know, the trouble is that somehow I press something on my computer and it says you you have a meeting in progress, you can start to join a new meeting after you leave the pre meeting. So what should I do? <laughs> so that but you can, can see my we can, we can hear you so uh, nothing has changed no. as far as uh, no no so but i don't think you can see my face you, you, you can we can see see we can see you and we can hear you so you may continue oh is that so okay but yes. i can see anyway but if you can sort this out it will be helpful now insofar as one china policy is concerned um 
you know, for some years now, we've uh, in our joint statements, we are not referring to uh, India's support for one China policy. This used to be the case, but under even under the Manmohan Singh government, we stopped doing that. Uh, I think we faltered a little bit uh, when uh, we got uh, uh, a new route two months over, uh, and uh, the Chinese uh, were successful in getting into the joint statement a reference to India thanking Beijing and the and the authorities in Tibet for this gesture. And I was <laughs> a bit surprised as to why uh, we uh, had to agree to this. Uh, this was during Sushma Sabra's time. Uh, why we had to agree to this? Uh, because uh, it's a decision that was taken between the government of India and the government of China, that is Beijing. Uh, the authorities in Tibet didn't take any independent uh, decision. So this was sort of a bringing in indirectly again uh, this whole business about uh, Tibet being part of uh, China. But of course, the one China policy to be accurate has nothing to do with Tibet. It has to do with Taiwan. And uh, the, its, it's, uh, it's uh, origin is in the uh, agreement between uh, China and uh, uh, US during Nixon Kissinger's time, uh, where Taiwan was a big issue and where the United States agreed to subscribe to the one China policy. Now, the uh, the uh, uh, the Chinese have very artfully <laughs> uh, expanded uh, the scope of this one China policy to cover all of Chinese claims, <laughs> whether in Tibet or anywhere else or, or in uh, potentially perhaps even the South China Sea. Uh, so, uh, uh, as I said, we now no longer support the one China policy, but that is a good step. But at the same time, uh, we need to uh, uh, create more room for ourselves in dealing with Taiwan. Uh, simply not speaking about One China uh, doesn't give us the kind of diplomatic space that we need in the face of continuing Chinese provocations in claiming our territory, uh, whether it's in Nashal Pradesh and now even in uh, uh, Ladakh. Uh, there is some hesitation on the part of uh, government to do so. Uh, I suppose. Uh, the reasoning could be, I don't know, I don't know what they're thinking currently is. The reasoning could be that it is such an utterly sensitive issue uh, for China that uh, if we took some overt step uh, in this regard, then uh, the scope for uh, uh, engaging China uh, to see if there can be a non-military solution to the border problem would recede. And the Chinese attitudes will harden. Because for them, uh, if you look at their, their, what they are doing even today in terms of violating Taiwan's uh, air, of airspace and, uh, and and sending in the airplanes, uh, bombers, this and that, uh, close to Taiwan, uh, not concerned about uh, U.S. reaction, goes to show that uh, China can act uh, uh, much more uh, aggressively if India were to. Uh, take a position. Therefore, in terms of uh, uh, loss and gain, uh, how much do we gain from this? And in turn of the, uh, and uh, what will be the advantage of this in terms of what the losses would be? So I think if that pragmatic exercise is made, then the reasoning could be that the less weight. Uh, Taiwan is not going to disappear. and uh, We'll have other opportunities. So we'll see how the whole thing evolves with China. Uh, and then we take certain certain decisions. Uh, that is how uh, I would interpret this. With regard to the BRI, uh, there is no way that uh, uh, we can compete with China on the, on the, BR, on the connectivity front. Uh, for China, this is, a, this is a huge strategic exercise intended to uh, expand China's influence in the world, create constituencies for itself all over the world, uh, not only in Asia, but also in Africa and in Latin America and in the ASEAN. They are putting everything they do under this uh, head and then uh, use the influence they get uh, then to uh, penetrate those countries with their latest technologies, including digital technologies. And in that domain, therefore, begin to uh, begin to propose a, an international challenge, global challenge uh, to the United States and the West in the technology 
area. So with three, four trillion dollars of reserves and uh, management of its uh, uh, economic policies very centrally um, in Beijing, uh, this is not something that we can emulate. Our own connectivity uh, projects, which uh, are making some headway, even with Nepal, despite all difficulties, uh, we are we are doing some significant connectivity projects uh, with uh, Bangladesh too, with uh, uh, as part of our Act East policy, uh, and during the recent visit of our foreign secretary and uh, army chief, uh, there there is been some talk about uh, uh, some other project uh, connectivity project um, with uh, with uh, uh, Maldives. We have. Uh, started something also in terms of a ferry or whatever but but this is small time uh, now what can be done in terms of supplementing our efforts uh, is uh, to join others japan is interested japan is backing uh, the uh, more uh, asian connectivity uh, and and is willing to help and cooperate with india in this regard potentially also in africa us also has its uh, uh, program for uh, funding uh, connectivity uh, projects. Uh, they they have uh, now launched this uh, whole concept of uh, I forget how it is termed, but uh, a, a kind of a clean infrastructure project or something like that, uh, which will uh, which will uh, not have which will avoid all the features of China's BRI in terms of uh, viability of projects, uh, proper economic studies avoiding debt traps uh, and making sure that it really benefits the people and it's not based on resource attract, uh, extraction, et cetera. So the potential is to join hands uh, to the extent that we can. It's not, it's not an easy exercise to, to join hands with these countries uh, and have a combined effort uh, to give, the, give alternatives to the BRI uh, to the countries in our region and across the world. Insofar as the ASEAN centrality is concerned, you know, personally, uh, I am, I can understand why we have to emphasize ASEAN centrality, uh, because if, uh, as it is, ASEAN is very, is, is concerned about uh, the mounting China-U.S. Uh, confrontation. Uh, as we all know, they don't want to take a, uh, take sides. Uh, they would like to continue to have security cover from the United States, but continue their economic uh, relations with uh, China. Uh, in fact, their biggest partner now, China is now their biggest partner. So uh, uh, if uh, the ASEAN's uh, support uh, gets uh, support, I'll phrase it differently. If, if ASEAN begins to feel concerned about the Indo-Pacific and uh, and uh, the accord, uh, then we'll have great difficulty in giving more depth uh, to these uh, projects. Uh, so, uh, and then of course, as you know, uh, in in uh, in the East Asia Summit, uh, which has all the powers, including U.S. and Russia and China, uh, there is a discussion on uh, the Asian regional security architecture. And truly, ASEAN has been the central. Uh, motivator in this. So there is an effort uh, then to uh, assuage uh, the ASEAN that even if you are thinking of Quad and even if there's the Indo-Pacific concept, it is not intended to uh, to in any way dilute ASEAN centrality. Now, we are careful that ASEAN remains largely supportive, even if passively, uh, to what uh, Quad and Indo-Pacific concepts are. And in that, Vietnam and Indonesia are very critical. Uh, but then, uh, frankly, ASEAN uh, is, in, is in no way, to, is in no position to actually structure any regional security architecture. They're not being able to handle even the South China Sea dispute, despite the fact that they won the case, the Philippines won the case in, in the arbitration tribunal. And you can see how Philippine Duterte has been going hot and cold, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes uh, engaging China, at other times engaging the U.S. Uh, Vietnam is also in a difficult situation because uh, 
uh, it has very close economic ties with with china and the communist party uh, has a particular uh, thinking about uh, these matters at the same time china is a threat to them uh, indonesia is showing more boldness and we have uh, engaged indonesia uh, in this regard with some success but they remain a bit cautious nevertheless uh, but if ASEAN couldn't even agree on a code of conduct in the South China Sea, how are they going to create any regional security architecture? And giving centrality to them actually means that uh, uh, we are uh, compromising uh, on uh, creating a, a realistic security architecture uh, in this part of the world. Therefore, my view is that we have to persuade ASEAN that while we'll continue to give you support in terms of your centrality but you should at the same time view the quad and the indo-pacific as a very significant important line second line of defense against china's expansionism by non-asean countries that is, uh, that is uh, the diplomatic exercise that we need to do uh, i think i've answered uh, the south china sea issue while replying to uh, the issue of asean centrality yeah, yeah. I, you had uh, uh, in your presentation uh, briefly touched upon uh, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, Maldives, etc. In so far as China is concerned, but I think there is a question about uh, uh, your views on India's neighborhood policy overall. How effective it is? What are we doing with the neighborhood? I'd like to say something on that, and also maybe you could also bring in. How does India look at Afghanistan? You touched upon this, but if uh, uh, what kind of a challenges uh, will post peace uh, uh, talks Afghanistan create for India? Once you know Taliban have taken over uh, Afghanistan, as you said. Well, you know, uh, it is right uh, in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of defining uh, the priorities in our foreign policy. Uh, to say neighborhood first but uh, neighborhood first is not going to deliver uh, what we want to achieve in terms of our uh, global profile and our rise uh, the neighborhood is not going to uh, be our biggest trading partner or give us the technologies we need or give us defense uh, capabilities or help us uh, take positions on international platforms uh, you know which uh, serve our interests uh, they're very a they're very small very very small and uh, in, in fact uh, uh, we can do all this uh, without uh, really needing them uh, the other is that uh, we cannot have a viable neighborhood first policy uh, for two reasons one of course is pakistan the other is china uh, after all, the core of neighborhood first policy should be a regional organization, which means SARC. Uh, but Pakistan, as we know, has, uh, has right from the start made sure that uh, SARC uh, never uh, acquired any serious depth. Uh, the, after, if you talk about ASEAN and other things, security issues are there, but basically, Economic is, economics is the core of these the regional organizations. It, is, it was true also of the European Union. So SARC, if it had to develop into a credible organization, it should first, have, first of all address the economic issues. And there, as you know, even uh, the FTA that was agreed to uh, have uh, borne fruit because Pakistan doesn't want to trade with us, doesn't want to give us MFN. It doesn't even want to help Afghanistan uh, to have some kind of economic uh, benefits uh, which would stabilize Afghanistan internally by opening up trade between uh, India and Afghanistan uh, through its territory, it has even uh, prevented that. Uh, we also, and then China, and as I mentioned, and I won't repeat that, uh, it has made sure that uh, our uh, the management of our neighborhood becomes more and more difficult uh, for us because China and resources which, is, which it is using uh, to acquire influence in these countries, political influence in these countries, and making sure that uh, uh, on, they do not uh, back India uh, in its uh, differences, uh, in, Chinese, in Chinese differences with India. 
you will see that uh, in the current standoff, uh, uh, nobody has uh, said anything in our favor from the neighborhood. Uh, my own view is that uh, we should not give, we should give lip service to this, and we should actually generally try and see what we can do in terms of our other neighbors who are more uh, responsive to us. We should place much more emphasis on BIMSTEC, move away from, uh, from SARC, though it's not going to be easy, though theoretically it fits into our larger uh, activist policy uh, objective. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we, we should not uh, begin uh, assuming, or we should not uh, build our policy on the assumption that unilaterally we can uh, uh, make our neighborhood more congenial to us. Uh, we can't. The, the governments in our neighboring countries have also uh, to play their part and uh, make sure that whatever they do in terms of uh, advancing their interests with China or elsewhere or any other country, it is not done uh, in a way that India begins to feel insecure. Unfortunately, uh, so far, barring Bhutan, the other countries uh, have not uh, adopted this kind of thinking and approach uh, towards, uh, towards India. Therefore, we have a big challenge in our neighborhood policy. With regard to Afghanistan, uh, my own view is that if, uh, if the Taliban are given a share in power, uh, it, that's not going to help resolve uh, the fundamental, the core issue, uh, because uh, the Taliban wants an Islamic Emirate, and uh, the other side uh, wants to maintain, uh, preserve the gains uh, that have accrued uh, to the society in the last uh, uh, so many years after the eviction of Taliban. So there is a, a fundamental contradiction uh, there. And in drawing the new constitution, this will be a huge hurdle, huge hurdle as to what should be, what would be the nature of the uh, constitution. Even on that, if there is some agreement, uh, once uh, the Taliban uh, are in power, uh, they will begun, begin to uh, erode whatever has been agreed, and there will be no one then uh, who would challenge them. Internally, Afghanistan will not have the strength to challenge them, and external powers uh, will not come back into Afghanistan again. Now, you know, the Afghan leadership, the Taliban leadership, uh, the current leadership, they have learned uh, lessons from the past a little bit. They have become more savvy. Uh, they are clever, cleverer in terms of uh, diplomatic engagement and, and making the right noises. But I understand that below that level, uh, the Taliban is the same as it was before. Very, very fundamentalist in thinking. Very fundamentalist. Uh, and therefore, this leadership is not going to be able to maintain uh, its own forces in order. Uh, and Pakistan factor is there. So I, I have a feeling that uh, uh, we could by having huge instability in uh, Afghanistan. And it will come from these forces, the, the, general, the Taliban in general, uh, who are feeling very emboldened that uh, earlier they had defeated Russia and now they're throwing out the United States. And therefore, they'll become a source of problems for all the regional countries, including us. And we have to be very watchful. Uh, in your presentation, you had also uh, touched upon the instability in the Gulf. So there is one question. Uh, the disturbances in the region aside, even the indigenization programs in the Gulf countries could affect Indian diaspora. How well prepared is India to deal with this? Um, you know, it all depends on uh, the growth of our economy employment and jobs at home, uh, opportunities at home, uh, which will automatically relatively reduce the need uh, for people to go and search for employment and jobs in, in other countries. Uh, in uh, so uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, prospect for us. On the other hand, uh, uh, many of these countries, they are underpopulated relatively, and uh, they don't have the uh, requisite manpower. 
themselves trained manpower and competence uh, to uh, uh, handle their own economies and their own ambitions. Probably if Saudi Arabia has a certain vision of 2030 or whatever it is, and uh, UAE and Dubai uh, are, are now trying to uh, wean themselves away from total reliance. Uh, well, Dubai doesn't have oil, oil but finding new uh, ways of uh, making themselves relevant uh, to the rest of the world and supporting themselves. They need a lot of, lot of uh, uh, technical inputs, manpower, competent people, managers, uh, accountants, economists, what, what have you. So a certain level of uh, dependence on the outside world will remain and on India will remain. But when it comes to uh, uh, workers, uh, construction workers, this and that, the kind of slump that there is, because of COVID, that might get uh, affected. How well prepared we are, as I said, uh, this is not something that uh, you can uh, prepare yourself uh, adequately enough. A lot of people go from Kerala, for example, to, to the Gulf. Now, I don't know what government of India is thinking in consultation with the Kerala government is <laughs> with regard to what policies to pursue uh, to reduce this dependence. And then people who are returning, to give them opportunities and uh, have them find a place in uh, society uh, which will uh, give, uh, give them the ability to sustain themselves. It's a very difficult issue. There are some interesting questions about the US. Uh, have we bridged the trust deficit with the US so that the November elections would not change the direction of our partnership? And uh, what uh, do you think, uh, what do you think about the Quad's future? Will Quad take some bold steps to counter China or just uh, table talks and military exercises will happen? If India well, achieves self-reliance in defense manufacturing, how will it impact our relations, especially with the US? Well, firstly, insofar as November elections are concerned, uh, I think that there is uh, there is bipartisan support for a stronger India relationship. After all, Biden was very much a, a part of building the, uh, the, the bilateral ties. And there's no question about that. So what uh, people are warning us that on the issue of uh, human rights uh, and uh, what is happening internally in India with regard to communal relations, there will be pressure uh, from, uh, from the Democrats and uh, therefore, we'll need to do some firefighting and we should be prepared for that. But on the larger strategic uh, landscape, I don't think there'll be any significant uh, uh, difference. Insofar as uh, uh, defense manufacturing, you know, it's going to be a long process. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, it'll take many years. Uh, so even the first baby steps haven't been taken yet. So therefore, there is no question of any immediate impact of this on our defense ties with the US. Uh, but then uh, if uh, the US uh, sets up investment, uh, uh, makes investment in, in India, and if it is also used as a base for export to other countries, which is the objective, uh, then I think uh, the US companies can begin to benefit. Uh, um, Arvind, can you just wait for a few minutes? There's something that I need to do urgently. I'll just come back. Okay, okay. Meanwhile, uh, Jadev, would you like to make any comment on China? A very brief comment because when uh, Sabre returns, in the light of the various questions, in the light of the various questions raised uh, regarding, would you like to make any general comment? Well, just a couple of. I mean, I noticed a few of the questions about uh, the border dispute and exchange of maps. Uh, essentially, it's a question of you know, uh, uh, it takes two to tango. The Chinese have to be willing. And as far as my reading is concerned, the Chinese have been unwilling and they will continue to be unwilling. We are seeing that uh, in the context of additional claims being raised every once in a while, the latest being Ladakh. And I've been reading some commentaries which say that now in the border negotiations, 
I mean, when they're negotiating the border, at that time, Ladakh will also become an issue. So, um, you know, they're expanding the uh, uh, claim. So that is one. I don't think it will happen. The second is uh, the reading, how we read what is happening today. I think uh, Mr. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry for that because somebody was ringing incessantly on the bell. So anyway, uh, on the uh, I'll answer your question on uh, defense ties with the U.S. I think the whole idea is to, after all, it's not as if uh, they're going to be uh, all that in endless demands uh, from the government of India for all the items that are produced here. And we have this uh, ambition to become uh, an exporter of defense material. We already have not some relatively small successes in this in terms of figures that have been seen. But if the foreign companies come here, and especially U.S., uh, and they have uh, they supply arms to, to so many countries in the world, uh, so if they can partly use the Indian production uh, for export, uh, that can continue to uh, attract them to invest in the defense sector in India. With regard to Quad, um, I think we are making a slow progress. Uh, we've had this uh, ministerial level meeting. Uh, uh, again, and this is happening uh, uh, under the shadow of uh, China's uh, aggression in Ladakh and its uh, pressure on Japan, um, increasing pressure on Japan on Senkaku, uh, and of course the serious deterioration of uh, U.S. of Australia uh, China ties, uh, and despite the fact that Australian opinion is divided on handle, on how to handle China because the economic interests are very considerable. The Morrison government uh, has made it very clear that uh, they are going to uh, support the United States and take up the China challenge much more vigorously because China is interfering in their internal affairs. Uh, <clears throat> my own view is that, uh, and I reflected that in an article I wrote in Economic Times the other day, that I can't understand if we are members of uh, RIC and more particularly BRICS and SEO, which have structures, then what's our problem in also uh, having a quad which is structure, which has a regular agenda or meetings? BRICS issues uh, uh, statements, so why can't uh, some statement, uh, joint statement uh, be issued? Do I know it will be difficult to negotiate uh, with? Uh, Trump and Pompeo in power because uh, they want to drag China in a very frontal way into the joint statement which other countries are reluctant uh, to do uh, because they want to maximize uh, uh, pressure on, uh, on China by holding it responsible for the Wuhan virus, which it is, uh, and of course, uh, pointing out uh, uh, what China threatened in the Communist Party and all that. So others are not willing to go that far. But the, nevertheless, I think uh, uh, we, we can we can uh, we can support uh, structuring the quad. And finally, I would say that as things are, China is not going to change its thinking and policies. Xi Jinping has uh, set the direction uh, for China. China is now uh, copying United States in statements in every way, uh, very aggressively. Uh, it is not buckling down. It has increased its pressure on Taiwan. Uh, despite everything, uh, it's not relenting, and it's just, it has committed the aggression against India, running up an, another front. Now, this means that the China challenge will remain uh, for all of us, and therefore, to my mind, this uh, accord will uh, acquire the kind of profile that I think it should. Well, sir, I think we'll. Uh end the session but not before asking you one uh, your opinion because there was a question also what do you think of uh, imran khan's future imran khan's future yes uh very difficult the to say but, of... I, 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 but hmm. the thing is that imran khan unless there's a military takeover which is very unlikely uh, there is no replacement. Now the opposition parties, whether in the Vashri for PPP, they have come out very boldly against uh, the military. Uh, so, uh, and I, I saw the statement of Bajwa uh, saying that uh, 
the army is doing what is necessary and is in national is is doing what is allowed in the constitution and it is in national interest. Uh, so uh, uh, the army is not going to give up its uh, role and its uh, uh, position in uh, in in uh, Pakistani politics. Uh, and at the moment, uh, they have no one but uh, Imran Khan. So if they remove Imran Khan, either they take over themselves, uh, or what do they do? They have no option. And uh, uh, and what the and Imran Khan uh, seems to be playing his cards uh, in the eyes of some people I've been speaking to from the Islamic countries. Uh, the fact that he has taken on, taken on Saudi Arabia a little bit. And uh, and positioned himself as uh, one of the uh, Sunni leaders uh, who wants to take over leadership of the Islamic world along with Turkey or whoever else is uh, giving him some internal support because I was told by someone that uh, in uh, Pakistan itself and even in India. Uh, there is a lot of concern about the policies that are being produced, uh, pursued in Saudi Arabia by Mohammed bin Salman. So this strengthens uh, the uh, Islamic support uh, for the regime in, uh, in, in the current regime in, in Pakistan. So for all these reasons, I think uh, he will hang on. Well, I think uh, we should thank uh, Ambassador Sibyl for his uh, masterly presentation. And a very lively Q and A. He's answered, I think, uh, all the questions very directly. And uh, this has, uh, I'm sure, given uh, the participants uh, uh, the opportunity to understand the nuances of the Indian foreign policy. There were many questions uh, which I haven't uh, taken uh, because there was no time. And also, I wanted to give a chance to those who are joining us uh, for the first time, and so that they could uh, interact uh, with us. So thank you very much, sir. I uh, greatly appreciate your uh, being with us. And now we will uh, meet tomorrow for our 